I could not believe what I was seeing. I could have filled the back of his head with 556, which is an absolute joke. Well, it's not an ape, because if the Sasquatch was an ape, we would already have one. What are these elusive hominids that stalk the wilderness? Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to the mystery. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Creek Devil. As everyone may remember, we had Carol on last week's episode, so she had a lot more to tell, so we have her back today. Carol, how are you? I'm still here. I'm not a sack lunch yet. That's always a plus, never being the sack lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Tom, do you want to go ahead and kick this one off? Yeah, absolutely. Carol, thank you for coming back, and we're we're going to finish up with the experiences and the, the uh, encounters that you had that we didn't have time for on the last episode. So this is going to be a part two. And just before we start, I want to say to all of our listeners out there, if you enjoy this content and you want to support the show, uh, you can click on the link below for Patreon, and, and there's different levels of support. All right, Carol, so let's, uh, if you can remember where we picked up from last time, it was absolutely mm-hmm. fascinating. Well, you know, I think that those creatures are fascinating. I think everything about it is fascinating because it's so new to us. And um, this is an old problem for me, but yet it's, it's, it's fascinating to, it seems like you get a little bit of information from each encounter. And, you know, I hope that I never have one of those bluff charges that I've heard about. Um, I've never had that. And I thank God that I haven't had that because I can't imagine what that would be like. I have had them come up a couple of times and touch me, which to me, that is too close. That's, that's not, um, in my, Carol, in my book, that's worse than a bluff charge. Uh-huh. I don't know. Cause they're actually touching you. But anyway, go ahead. Uh-huh. They always come up from behind when they touch me. And, um, this has happened. Oh, let's see. If I go back, when I was a young girl and I was with a friend of mine and we we were at the same uh, camping area on the Palma de Terre. And our folks would take vacation each year and we would go uh, down there and it was, you know, their primitive camping, I guess is what people would call it now. But, you know, we felt high finance because we had some mini bikes to share and, and uh we had some campers we could stay in. They usually had, at, some of their kids at least, in a tent. And I, I never tented it. But uh, they had, we had a situation uh, with my a friend that was my age. And we had walked down to a low water bridge there. That, that was kind of the hangout. I had several encounters around that low water bridge on the uh on the little Palma de Terre. And of course, all of that now in South Missouri, all of that is flooded and it's the lakes area now. It's all underwater. Um, but, you know, we were down there skipping stones and my dad had taught me to skip stones and I was getting pretty good at it and I really enjoyed it. My dad could skip a rock uh, 20 skips. It wasn't uncommon for him to be able to do that. So I was wanting to get there, you know, and we were playing down there at the water and we began to have some body up high on a rock bluff on the opposite side of the stream, throw rocks back at us. And, uh, the rocks were pretty good sized rocks and, you know, we weren't throwing rocks at them, but after we had thrown a few rocks, there would be this big rock come flying out of trees up there and we could never really make out who this was and we got tired of it and finally you know we took turns saying you know 
stop it. We're not playing around. We're not throwing rocks at you, whatever. And, um, you know, the rocks would land close at our feet and splash us. And um, we were standing in knee-deep water or so while we were playing around, you know, uh, looking for rocks and throwing rocks and things. And I had looked up there, and I had seen, it looked to me, and here it was hot weather, and it looked to me like maybe a, a teenage boy with a black hoodie on. Oh, my, I couldn't make out a face. It's like the face was, um, you know, dirty. The face didn't stick out. The face just kind of blended in with the whole thing. It all looked kind of charcoal to me. And I saw this long arm come off of that bluff, and it like it crouched down. And I saw it pick up a rock and hurl that rock at us. And I thought, well, that just tears it. And it didn't go over well with me. And I said, excuse me, I don't know who you think you are, but we're not bothering you. And we don't want you to bother us. And if, if we're messing up your fishing or something, come on down here and let us see you. And you come down and you start whatever you want to do and we'll go away. Well, after I said my piece, I turned my back looking for another rock, and the thing beamed me real, real good between the shoulder blades, and then we started having rocks hailing around us, and I remember my friend uh, speaking up and saying, I'm going to tell my dad something like that. Of course, that it, nothing we said made a bit of difference, and we got out of there, and um, I, I have related uh, some of these stories to Nance Warren with uh, Buckeye Bigfoot, and she's read some of these accounts. So um, I had an account, um, an experience of the fall. I think it would probably be the following year. It was it was close in period of time because sometimes we stayed down there two weeks and it, it it gets hard to figure out if it was the next time we went down or if it was you know later on at the end of the two weeks. But anyway, this happened next. We had to camp in a place that we didn't really like, and it was high up on a bluff. And um, I mean, the edge of that campground was on a kind of a jetty I mean that was straight down to the water and there really was no place for a human to walk and uh, the only thing that kept it from eroding completely away I guess was the you know the scrub and the trees and then there's a lot of rock the ground is nothing but rock there and um, I remember we had we had an old dog with us and that dog was uh, scratching himself on the grass at the edge of it and he kept rolling around and we kept calling him away from there and all of a sudden he just slid right over the bank and fell down below and we couldn't see him we heard the splash we couldn't see him so I remember that was one of the things that happened and my dad had to go get the uh, boat out and go around and rescue him and bring him back and he looked he looked really embarrassed <laughs> it was funny it's something that stands out in my memory well I decided that I was big enough girl that I wanted to go in the boat. And my dad told my mother, you know, we'll give her one oar, and she won't be able to get very far with one oar. She won't know how to use it. And I did. I'd been watching them all, all my life. I knew how to use the boat oars. And so he gave me the one paddle, and he tied me up with my, um, you know, my neon vest and stuff and put me out there in the John boat and away I went. So my idea was to go all the way up the arm of the little Palma de Terre up to that low water bridge. And the water level was up somewhat and so uh, they had had they had had storms, you know, that had had time to calm down and things had settled down. But you know, it was really dumb of me to go up that far because it was dangerous. There were uh, fallen trees there was a lot of debris you know on the bank and in the water and so forth I got up to that um, low water bridge and I do remember feeling like something was watching me 
and it was coming from behind me on this very steep cliff, and there were caves up in that cliff that you could see the cl- the caves. I never went up there and got into it, uh, but I guess there were young men that had climbed up there and looked in those caves. I don't want anything to do with it. They were pretty large openings up there and a lot of brush and overgrown and all that. But I always felt creepy when I passed there, and I, I never really mentioned that before, but got up there to that little water bridge, and instead of turning around like I should have done and gone back to camp, what I did was I went under under there, and I continued on the other side, and I ventured up farther than I had ever ventured. And there were there was just this wall of uh, broken limbs and uh, old deadfall in the water, and I had to figure out how to get around that in order to get on the other side because, you know, I had been up in that area, but I wanted to go on further. And I remember that there was a definite sound. It, it, now, this is going to sound funny, but to me as a kid, the only thing that I could think of that sounded like this was I'd been to uh, creek baptisms, full immersion, and if you baptized a you know, a large man, and he, when he stood up, his clothing would drain the water. You could hear, you know, a large person rise up out of the water. You can hear it. It has a, a specific sound to it, and that is what I heard when I got closer. I got around that wall of timber stuff, and I decided, oh, well, what's this? And as I got close, I saw large tracks, and then I noticed these baby tracks. And I thought, bare feet, you know, in the, there was a lot of silt. It, oh, it was nasty. I mean, that place was a cotton mouth heaven. And I knew better than to get out of the boat, but I went ahead and pulled it up there. And I looked real carefully, and I stepped out and let, you know, slide the slippy, nasty mess. So I didn't do much there except look around and look at the tracks. And there was still, you know, water draining into the tracks. And what it looked like to me was like the little tracks that were about six or seven inches long, they were also barefooted. They didn't have claws. Neither of them did. And I believe them now to be Bigfoot tracks. And it looked to me like the adult maybe was wading in the water with a little one and set it down and rose up out of the water and maybe picked up that young one and took off because the tracks were very obvious and went off up into the up the bank and through the fallen timber and the dark woods and I wasn't going to go up there but got back in the boat and I felt really weird and I went back to camp and then it was just a couple days later that I had uh, time I was bored and I had, had had my boat oar taken away from me. My dad had said, you went where? And you went how far? And he said, I don't, I don't think you need to be doing that anymore. And so he took away my, my pretty boat oar. <laughs> I said, well, I, I didn't go back in the woods or anything. And he said, no, he said, but it bothers me that you saw something look like human footprints. I said, I didn't see any shoe tracks. I heard something come up out of the water, and the water was still draining in, you know, like there was a stream of water that traveled along with these steps. And I just saw a few of the little tracks right by the water's edge, and then I didn't see them come. I didn't see them leave. It was like it got picked up and carried out of the the situation. So my dad said, well, you suppose somebody got stranded up in there and the next day he decided he would go up in there and he wanted me to show him where and I showed him and he got out and he investigated and whenever we went back to camp he told my mother he said well it's not bear tracks he said I it doesn't look like anything I've ever seen it it looks a lot like human tracks but they're very very big and he said I don't know who on earth would be dumb enough to take a kid and try to go into a situation like that, you know, and of course they turned to me and he had a few stern words for me. And it was a few days after that that I got 
this time on my hands, and I had my boat oar taken away from me, so I decided that I was going to go down to that low water bridge, and I had my mini bike out of commission, so I would have to walk it, and I wasn't used to walking that far. I was used to riding the mini bikes, and so I asked my mother if she would walk me down there, and she said no, and she was in camp, and my dad was off running trot line or something, and so I decided to go down there, and I, I started out too late, and I got there, and I was kind of wiped out, and I sat down on the bank, which you had kind of the bank drop down away from this other campsite, which was by the low water bridge, and nobody had taken that. So there wasn't anybody around. So I sat down on the water's edge, and I decided, well, I'm going to play with the water, and I'm going to, you know, look for little critters in the water, and I like to just sit and observe, and it was very, very, uh, you know, you could hear you could hear and see birds and things like this, and then it started getting quiet, and I thought, well, that's kind of strange, and I sat there for a while, and the the sound that broke the silence was like two rocks being struck together. Uh, it struck once, and it was on my right side, which uh, there was woods wrapped mm, from the water on my right side all the way around behind me, and the woods were continuous behind me along the road between the water and the road all the way back to my camp. And there were dance. I'd never set foot in there. And I heard that one clack, and I think this went on for a little while before I actually, you know, realized, hey, there's a pattern here, and what, what makes a rock clack like that? I hadn't seen anybody. Nobody, nobody ever uh, showed themselves in camp. There wasn't any, even any trash, or nobody left anything there to make it, or if they'd even been there, at least. So then to my left, which would be... Uh, you know, on the other side of the bridge, because I was close to the bridge. It would be across the road and on the other side of the bridge, kind of where my friend and I had been throwing rocks at each uh, Well, we weren't throwing them at each other. We were throwing rocks to skip rocks, and then that thing was throwing rocks at us. That, that was where that happened. Well, there were trees up there, and there were fields, and you really couldn't see through it. And from over from my left, I heard clack, clack. And then after a little while, there were three clacks behind me, but it was some distance behind me. And I thought, well, I suppose never heard any bird or any, that must be somebody. That's what that is. It's somebody. So I waited around a little while, and I heard clack to my right, clack, clack to my left, and again, clack, clack, clack. And each time it got a little bit closer. And I thought, well, I'm going to look around here and find myself a couple of rocks. So I did. And I decided, well, I'm going to, next time that they go clack, 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 I'm just going to insert myself in there and have fun with this. Well, they went clack, and I went clack, clack really fast. Well, there was complete silence. It lasted for a while. And I thought, Hmm. I I think I threw off their I think I threw off their game or their schedule or something. And then finally I heard the one with three clacks go clack clack clack. And then the guy to the right clack. And then the guy to the left clack clack. So I jumped in and I went clack 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 and took the guy behind me's turn. And of course I'm thinking this has to be people. Well, there was a silence again. And I kept thinking, what am I dealing with here? This, this is not a woodpecker, but woodpeckers don't, they don't act like this. And the guy to the right, clack. The guy to the left, clack, clack. The one behind me, clack, 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 getting closer. So I took my rocks and I decided, well, I'm going to show them what a human sounds like. And I just banged away and just fast as I could bang. And then I sat there quietly and... I didn't hear anything for a minute. Then pretty soon, I heard clack again to the left, clack, clack, one behind me three times, clack, clack, clack. And then they, they sped up, and it ended up going 
something like this. I don't know if this will translate very well, but I happen to have two rocks here. And it sounded like this. But they sped up and they got to the point I couldn't keep up with it. And it kept going. And it was fast. I mean, they didn't miss that rhythm. It kept on going. I thought, well, I never heard of anything like that. And the hair on my neck raised up. So I stood up and this clacking ceased. And I thought, you know, I've had enough of this. And I kind of banged my rocks together a few times and I threw them in the water. And I thought, i got to get back to camp. This is later than I didn't realize it was getting late like this. And I had to pass pretty close to the one that was to the left of me. So I did that, and I tried to stay. I went down the road on my side. And then once I got to that really brushy part where the one behind me, the sound had come from, I got over farther to the field away from that brush that was on my left-hand side. All the way back, I had uh, this wall of woods. And something walked along with me as I walked that. And it would stop when I stopped. If I was walking along and I stopped and like was going to take another step and I paused my foot in midair and didn't step, I could hear it take a step. And it was two feet. And I never could see it. But I could see part of it as it moved through the woods. I could see this dark, something dark and tall moving through the woods with me. And I got up so far to the point that I thought, you know, I'm just going to break down here and, you know, wet myself. And my parents showed up. I can't really remember if it was my mother that came for me or if my father came for me, but I don't know. I was so happy to get back to camp, I couldn't hardly stand it. Um, that was two, that was a couple of the three things that happened before we actually had the sighting in the camp. And I had another really horrific time um, when I went up. I decided to take the mini bike and go further than I had before. And there were people that lived up in there, and we knew them. We had met them while we were camping. They had a whole bunch of kids. And I thought, well, I'll go up there and, and go so far, and then I'll, when I get tired, I'll turn around and I'll go back. And I got up there, and there were it the road got really difficult, especially for a mini bike. It was just like trying to go up steps, you know, with the rock and the way that it was washed out and stuff. Everything everywhere I looked, the farmers had uh, barbed wire, and um, they had uh, stretched over. Uh, washed out places with the barbed wire and looked like they had kept on top of that because now I was passing area that belonged to some farmers. And I got up in there where the brush was really dense. dense. It was a lot of uh, cedar trees, and I heard a horrible, horrible scream. And it was up to my right. And I had my helmet on, and even with the helmet and the padding, this was absolutely blood curdling. And I thought, well, I will get up here to this flat spot. The rock, there was a lot of kale and rock and stuff up there, and I thought, well, that's a, a good place for me to turn around. And before I could get there, I slipped the chain on the mini bike, and so I got off of it and. Um, I kept watching that area where I heard that scream, and I did see one. Uh, it, its hair was bright red. I can't tell you if it was a male or a female, but it, it saw me. I saw it. It was very tall, and it was up there uh, clinging onto a um, tree. I don't know what kind, but like tree snags sticking out of the rock formation up there and I mean it was like blink and miss it I mean it was there and it was gone it was that fast I turned around and I put my knee on the seat of the mini bike and I decided to use it kind of like a, a scooter or something and, and kick with my foot and and go back downhill unfortunately I you know had downhill to help me 
a little bit, but it didn't it didn't roll very fast. Little tires, you know. Well, off to see, and I turned around, so I was coming back down the way I came. So now on the, my right side, almost in the thickest part of the cedars, where they had it uh, fenced off, I heard what I thought was a bull. And I mean, that thing was loud, and it. I mean, it absolutely terrified me, and I thought, well, I've done it now, and I'm up here, you know, my folks probably wouldn't even know where to find me. And I thought, well, I'll ignore, and I'll just keep moving down the way I came. And that thing was started ripping out trees and breaking brush. It sounded like like someone was coming through there in a, in a, a pickup or a, some kind of a farm machinery. I mean, it just was so loud, and this thing was sounded so angry, and I really thought I'm I'm going to die. I may not get out of this. Uh, it was coming on fast, and it was coming to me faster than I could get away from it. And I thought, well, I just keep my helmet on, and you know, don't don't look back. And uh, about the time that I came to a, a steep, steep gully, there a uh, wash that they had it bridged with um looked to me like they had used telephone poles and they had barbed wire and it was strung so high i i couldn't you know thought about it since i thought what on earth were they trying to keep in there you know and i just told myself well it's got to be a bull that's what it's got to be and i turned around as i came to that wash because it's on a curve and i glanced over my shoulder and i could see a black upright hairy thing as big as a bull coming through the cedar trees and still screaming. And I tell you, I didn't look back again. I kept going downhill and I kept pushing for, I was crying. I was trying to get out of there as fast as I could get out of there and, and not fall down really. Uh, that was, that was another time that, that, that just was so, that was so frightening. And, I uh, told my parents, they said, well, you, there might have been a bull loose up there. You're going to end up getting hurt. And you don't need to go up there. And I said, well, the, okay, the black one, tell me it's a bull, but it was upright. And the thing that I saw up on the hillside that was red, God help me, that was not a bull. And so they just said, well, you, that does it for you, young lady. You don't go back up there anymore. Unless you're with us in the pickup, you don't go up there. And I said, yes, I agreed to that. Um the time that really scared us that we got the full uh, we got the full view of one of these was we'd gone down there I was 13 or 14 and we had a vacation earlier that was mm, several several months to a year before that and we had gone to the Great Smoky Mountains and I had seen bear and um, you know you know I was comparing in my head that, that, that wasn't what I saw. And then I started hearing that Missouri's bear population was pretty well decimated and that they'd been, you know, hunted out a long time before I was ever born. Well, then we went back to permanent terror, and this was about 1974. And um, the reason that I told this story at all to, uh, I had called Brenton Sawin, He's deceased now, and hoping that someone I would talk to would would be able to tell me something. And the one thing that he said to me that made my blood run cold was, you know, they say not to feed these things. And at first I said, well, I'm not feeding them on purpose. And he said, no, but are you putting scraps out or throwing away table scraps or anything at all like that? And I, I had to admit, yeah, at, at home, yes, I was doing that, you know. Not like Kansas City, but after I moved and became an adult and we moved down uh, to where I live now, yes, I was doing that. So um, I, I still was not quite over the shock of what I'd seen when I was 13, 14 years old. And I didn't have an answer as to what I had seen, except I had seen a, a few minutes uh, spot on television where they showed the lineup of uh, the you know, black and white line drawing of where they kind of compare different creatures that had been, you know, spoken of through the years and that people had 
drawn or described. And I mean, that was just a flash on a, a news program, and that was it. And when when we saw that, my dad and mom and I were all sitting in our living room in Kansas City, and when we saw that flash on the screen, we all, our jaws dropped open, we looked at each other and went, that's what we've been having problems with. Because in Kansas City, uh, from the time I was a little child, we would have toys come up missing, which you just figure somebody came through the yard and did that, but we would we would uh, sometimes see, like my brother would have basket. We had basketball that came up missing, and a new football that came up missing, and and he found them down in the gully. And they, when he found them, they'd been down there, and they, you know, coated with mud. They'd been down there for some time. It wasn't like somebody took it, took it home and played with it. It was down there. And uh, I had a doll that was taken that was torn limb from limb, and you know what it was made out of. It, it was put together good and it had screws and stuff. It was made out of hard vinyl back in the day. And my dad said there wasn't any way anybody could pinch that up in little bits like it was. Um, and, you know, children eat and then they handle things. And so I, you know, I told my mom, I said, well, it probably had my scent on it. And, you know, it did and probably food scent. Um, and it was a doll I'd gotten when I was five. So, um that happened, and then our trash was always being plundered, and my dad was always trying to build a better enclosure to keep the trash in, uh, to keep, and it was uh, phenomenal strength that something was showing. Sometimes they'd take the container that he made to uh, cover the trash and completely flip it out of the way, even though he put blocks on it or timbers on it or attached it to the ground some way, it would be completely flipped over and the trash would be gone through. Sometimes a, a whole bag would be missing. Um, so you know you can you know you can say to yourself, well, it's Kansas City. You know they find dead bodies and people end up you know they eat out of the garbage and you you have you have a lot. Of, I mean, Lower East Side we had a lot of crime. So when my dad took up beekeeping, that was another thing. Uh, he kept his aluminum boat back there. Uh, in the backyard and he got fencing and he put very high fencing around the backyard because he put his bees in there and he didn't want somebody's child to wander into that space well I knew the flight paths of the bees and I grew up with them so I could go in the backyard if I needed to and you know my dad could mow back there and not upset them and I could go back there if he sent me to water them or whatever and I knew the flight path, I never got stung the whole time we lived there. And I, I was in my 30s when I left, and and I never got stung because we knew what we were doing with the bees. But somebody was not using the gate, stepping over the fence, it looked like, because he would lock the gate and someone would still get in there at night. It was always at night, and they would take the lids off of the uh, beehives because he had supers. And they'd fling those out of the way um, and just make a mess and go through uh, the hives and take out. Here's the weird part. Who robs your honey and eats all the developing bees? You know, the, the pupas? Who, who does that? Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just that's... Weird, you know. People would bring, uh, you know, if they were, if, okay, if I were doing this, I'd wear a bee bonnet. And I would go back and I would have a five-gallon bucket, and I'd have my bee gloves and so forth, and no dark colors. I would take my, uh, you know, my frames out and wipe the bees away, and I'd put them in that, stand them up. You can, you can get quite a lot of honey in a five-gallon bucket. Whoever this was was coming over the fence and doing this mischief, and we just couldn't, we just could not figure that out. I mean, they would almost wipe him out and uh, break the frames up, and it would be there where, you know, who comes in your yard and eats 10 pounds of honey, comb and all, with the pupas and the wax is gone and everything. You know, it's just it's strewn around. So he got the idea to, to try to take his aluminum boat and put it behind the hives and make it almost impossible for them to step up over the fence. It happened anyway. It didn't make a speck of difference. So those are just a few of the weird things that happened when we were living in, in Kansas City. And then when we moved on south, 
we found out they were there too. And we sure wouldn't have bought it if we had known that. And I already told you that the person that had it had had it before us had uh, problems with uh, something attacking his friends and party goers there. And then before that, the woman that owned it before that, it's on the title. I looked it up after I spoke to you again, and it says that the woman that had the property had disappeared and was not found, and that was written into the title. So, you know, That's it just odd. didn't... Wow. It, it's odd. It is odd. And it said, you know, it states it in a, in a, you know, how do you say, an official sort of way. But basically what it's saying is since she's gone, then this reverts back to the person who had it previously. And since she cannot be found, then this reverts back to the person who had it and that it has been sold to. And then, you know, I won't go into the names. But anyway, that's, on, that's right on the title to the place. So I don't know what to tell you uh, more, except I've had too many weird experiences. Like um, uh, I got to the point where I had to go outside during the daytime where I live now for it to be cool in the summer because basically we needed a lot of things done, and I'll be honest with you. Oh, man, I'll be honest with you. We had a guy that moved in next door, and he brought in like 45 cars. Mice, 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 mice. He lived in a school bus for a while, and then he built a little shack. And I tell you what, the mice, I mean, we had some cats, and those cats would stand out and, and look like eat, you know. <laughs> mice, mice, mice. Well, mice when they pulled those cars out of there, those mice came up under our trailer. Mobile home. A lot of people don't know what you mean when you say a trailer. A lot of Missourians just say trailer, whether they mean a mobile home or something you pull something with. But anyway, it's mobile home. And we began having problems in the night where we had central air set up. And the system was pretty new uh, when this happened. Something very powerful was knocking the skirting in, reaching up under our home, getting hold of the plastic tubing that you put under a mobile home to carry the air, you know, hot air, cold air, and just snarling, growling, horrible tussle underneath the home where we would lie awake all night with our eyes wide as pancakes thinking what on earth is under there and to the point they completely tore away all of the tubing that was under there underneath there that carries your air under your under your floor system in a mobile home they would just knock out a section of skirting they just push it in and it would pop down and then they would go up underneath there and I do think it was those things you know the Sasquatch because my goodness and the thing is that plastic is, is like gone and I think what it was is they I think they're eating rodents and they could hear the rodents running in underneath the flooring and stuff. And I think that they were after the rodents. They pulled out every bit of insulation we had. They tore the belly out of the home. Uh, by the time this was happening, uh, you know, when we first moved in, uh, sometimes, you know, I'd feed the cats or we'd have a neighbor's cat come down or something like that. And I would always sit on the uh, front steps while, while they ate. You know, and usually not do this in the dark, dark, but sometimes I, I couldn't help it, um, depending on what time we got down there. Because sometimes we were still going. My grandmother had cancer. We were still traveling back and forth a lot. So we, we kept these erratic hours, and which is probably, you know, to our benefit. But you do that with criminals, too. You know, in the city, criminals watch your house to watch your movements and watch when you come and go and so forth. And I figure this is the same way with these things because they had, they seemed to know when, what days we would be there and what days we, you know. We got to the point we wouldn't go outside at night at all. Uh, but got to the point you couldn't see any wildlife. When we, when we first had that place, 
you could see all kinds of wildlife. I mean, we saw bobcats um, occasionally, not real often, but bobcats would be like they were run out of the back timber. They'd come to the front in the open and walk, walk down the road trying to escape into the next cluster of trees across the road and always looked like they had a bad taste in their mouth, you know, like something was stop and look and look behind them and run like crazy. And we'd see deer. Um, one of the things that happened early on was there was this young deer, a female that uh, doe, she would take up with me. And I thought it was really odd that if I went down to the pond, I had this brainwave. I thought I was going to put in some flowers down by the pond, you know, and make it make it pretty and make a destination to walk down there. And I got about I got about a garden about the size of a bathtub before I got so scared I couldn't go back. But um, this doe would just appear, and she would be standing. She would get as close to me as she could. And sometimes I'd take, uh, you know, uh, a beverage, and I would take a sandwich or something like that with me to go down there and sit and, and relax a little bit and, you know, feed the catfish, whatever. Well, I'll tell you what. One day, my mother was outside, it was early morning, and and I was inside. We began to hear this terrific screaming, and it sounded like somebody blowing on a harmonica. That's the only thing I can say. You know, umpteen times louder than a harmonica can be, but it sounded like, like two notes at the same time, like, <laughs> oh, I, can't, I can't do it. But anyway, it's just terrific sound, loud sound. And we didn't know what was going on back there, so I rushed outside, and we both looked down the pasture looking uh, east at the backwoods. And that doe came running up out of the gully back there to the, that would be north of the pond, and she was terrified. She came up uh, running right at me, and I thought to myself, well, surely she's not going to hit the fence. You know, I thought. Man, if she hits me at the rate she's moving, I mean, if she hits me, it's not going to take much speed to, to take me out. And uh, she got so close to me that, I, I'm not kidding, she had her lip curled back. She was terrified. Her eyes were bulging. I mean, I almost could have, I got a, I got a glimpse of her eyelashes. That's how close she came to me. She ran right up to me. She turned on a dime, and she started spronking. And she spronked back and forth over that center fence there. And she did that three, four times, and she sparked off in a crazy way and landed in the south pasture. Both of us were looking at each other like, what is going on? And she uh, sparked on down uh, south of the pond, and then she did a crazy sideways twisting leap over the fence, and she was gone. And I don't know if she had a little, uh, you, you know, fawn down in that gully, and one of those things grabbed it. I don't know because, you know, we, we did have a few bobcat around, but I'm telling you, as these things uh, took over, we had the coolest little animals. We had, uh, you'd see a lot of squirrels, got to the point you'd never see a squirrel. Rabbits, never see a rabbit. Uh, we had legless lizards and really neat things like that that I was always into nature, and I liked to sketch these things and study them. And if I saw something I didn't know what it was, I would look it up in the Missouri Department of, of you know, I'd look it up to see what it was. Um, but they got to the point where they literally seemed to eat everything. We had some cats that people just pitch cats out in the country. It's it's sad, but and they do the same thing with dogs sometimes. But um, usually the farmers can't allow to have too many dogs run because they'll run your calves and they'll run your piglets and they'll they'll ruin you know they'll really damage your your uh, animals that you're trying to work with. And so. Um, but we had these cats that people would pitch out. We we never went out and got a cat. People would pitch them on us. And, you know, they literally, okay, I'm just going to go say it. They ate every cat we had except one, and she's sitting here with me curled up. She's the one that made it, and she's a homebody. She likes to stay inside. She's all white. Don't know why they didn't get her. I do know that I've seen her before. She'll, if she gets scared, she'll take off up a tree. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something that is absolutely certifiably makes me crazy. I know this sounds like it. But she would be outside sometimes, and she would see, I believe, see their legs as they searched around at night around the pickup and around the shed and so forth because they had their run of the place. When it got to be night, I mean, they were out there often. She would hide up underneath a pickup that was kind of sunk down in the mud, and, I mean, it's there to stay. I think that she would see their black, hairy feet, and she remembered it. So when my mother got her house in town, because, let's face it, after the one came inside that I told you about last time, I convinced my mother, I said, honey, you need to move out. They push you down when you're outside. They've knocked you down when you had your lunch. They've shoved me face first into my garden. Uh, it's not safe. And, you know, you don't want to throw anything away, and I understand that. But if you'll trust me, I'll try to clean things up here, and I'll make arrangements to have uh, the dumpsters taken out, stuff like this, and I'll try to put in a pole light, things like that. You find a home and go where you're safe, where you have running water and heat, and I want, you to, I want to see you taken care of. So she found a little home. She got that little home. What convinced her that we were in a desperate situation was when that one came in the house with us that I told you about last time. They came in in the morning in there with us. That was when I was sleeping on a pallet on the floor and my mom was on her cot. It came in with us and I said, Mom, do you understand now? I know, you, I know you've seen them. She said, yes, I have. She said, I don't want to leave you. And I said, I understand that, but let's start now. And sadly, she died before I could ever get anything really accomplished by the time that, that you know, it was just me moving her. By the time I moved her and then she fell and then after that she had blood clot and it, she just went down downhill something terrible all last year. And so I didn't get what we were hoping to do. I was hoping that she would, you know, have a long, longer, she had a long life, but I was hoping that she would have a longer one. Um, but, you know, these things... These things made it to the point where if, if my mother, my mother liked to ride the mowing uh, lawn tractor. She didn't like me to ride it. I think she thought she was protecting me, but, you know, I can certainly. I was pushing a string trimmer that's a lot more dangerous than, <laughs> than the rider was, to be honest with you, you know. But your mama always protects you, you know. And she, she mowed and mowed and it kind of started getting late and I went out there and I, I would tell her, I'd say, you don't realize that you need to come in, do you? What? You need to come in. Okay? Sometimes I could hear noises in the woods. And, you know, that's the thing. Those things are clever. They do not make that much noise here. We've got people living around us. And they do not make that much noise. I mean, if they make noise, they do it at night. You can hear a kind of a laughter sometimes. You can hear uh, like fake owl calls to each other. You can hear those things, but just as far just as, just as far as making unnecessary noise, I've never heard that. They are they are quiet. I mean, they watch you constantly. And so I never, they're well hid, so I never really know. I just always assume they're there. I'm, I'm sure they're not there 24-7, and I'm sure they do go on hunting raids or trips or, what you know, raid farms or what. I know they raid people's chickens and things, and I know they take calves. I've heard stories from other people that live in the area. Uh, in fact, not too long ago, I was standing in the grocery store, you know, and there we all were with our masks on, and uh, people in a small town, they know each other, and so this one person that was sacking, she says, uh, oh, hi, she says hi to me, you know, and I said, how are you doing? She said, oh, I'm busy. I said, yep, keeping busy, and about that time, she turns to a woman in line, and she says, 
uh, a woman said something to her. She goes, what can I do for you? And she goes, no, I was just explaining why my husband isn't in here. And the woman that was sacking said, yeah, you know, we haven't seen him for quite a while. And two or three of them chimed in and said, yeah, you know, and said his name. And she said, well, I don't know if I should even say this or not. And she said, well, is he okay? And she said, well, yeah, I guess he's okay, but he's just having a really hard time. And the sacker said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Is it something we can do anything about? And she said, well, I'll be honest with you. He says he saw Bigfoot. And everyone just kind of paused for a moment and looked at her and then didn't say nothing. And nobody looked too shocked. And, of course, I was in the next line picking up my sacks, and so I heard it all. I thought to myself, yeah, lady, tell me about it. I didn't say anything, but it's not that uncommon. I, I tell you what, um, what I was going to tell you about the lawnmower, because I'm, I'm crazy that way. I flit around, um, and I'm sorry. Um, I spend a lot of time by myself, and I, I joke about myself, and I say sometimes I look in the mirror to have company like a parakeet. <laughs> I got to laugh. I got to laugh. Uh, I don't you got to have some sensing. humor in all this, right? I got to have a sense of humor. I mean, if I don't have my sense of humor, I'd have lost it a long time ago because if I see something really strange, I'll just kind of go out loud. I'll say, okay, that's a new record, or all righty, you know, what's next? And, um, but my mom would get on that mower and this one time in particular, I went outside there. We'd been working in the yard the whole day, never caught up. And I said, honey, you come in. Supper's ready. It's been waiting on you. You don't need to be out here alone. She goes, oh, you know, I said, just leave it where it sits. So she left it. In fact, I think she ran out of gas, to be honest with you. And so uh, I walked her back up through the gate and, you know, on up around the corner of the house and inside. She says, okay, I'm going to go down and finish in the morning. I said, well, why don't you do that? And, you know, she had gas to get, I believe, if I remember right. I don't remember all the little details. But the thing was, the next morning, we went down there, and it was upside down. Her mower was upside down, and it was not where she left it. It was down by the pond. So I don't know what to think. But, you know, who would who would come on your property and, and do something stupid? I mean, yeah, kids pull pranks and things, but where I live at, they would have to park either right smack in front of my home where I could see them, or they would have to park way, way over somewhere, and it would be a hike through the woods in the dark with the gullies and stuff to get up there to turn my mower upside down to have me just come out and say, oh, I wonder how my mower got upside down. It seems to me like it's a lot of trouble just for nothing, but I think those things get, they would get, pardon my French, but they'd get pissed at us if we were out in our yard at night. Like if I was outside burning uh, trash or burning brush or something like that, uh, I, I had to quit doing that because I got afraid. I got to the point where, frankly, I would burn in my trash cans, um, and I had a uh, camper there. In fact, it's the same camper that I was in when we had our experience of when I was 13 or 14 down on the uh, apartment of Tower when we had one walk right into camp. Um, this is the same this is the same camper because my, after my father died in 1980, she just, she couldn't bear, some people are that way, she just couldn't bear to get rid of anything and, and move on. She didn't know how, I don't believe she knew how. She did nothing because she didn't know what to do. I mean, she was at a loss. So um, I kept that camper there, and let me tell you what, I kept it unlocked. And whenever I would burn trash or something, I would think to myself, can I see anything? I'm going to jump inside that camper. And I kept that camper for that reason, so that if I was in the yard, if I was working, and I was that far away from the doorway, I would step in that camper. I thought to myself, let them, 
let them try to get me in here. And, of course, you know, I don't like that aspect of it. And, you know, they could roll it over. But it was against the shed, so I felt like that, you know, I was – they couldn't tip it that direction anyway. But it, it's just weird to shape your whole life around what your hairy neighbors want you to do and, you know, what will, what will bend your hairy neighbors. Um, you know, you Carol, go down – Carol, I have to agree with you in, entirely. And, you know – Having that camper there, that's mm-hmm. just a little sense of security. I'm sure they can pick it up and move it. You know, and I, I'm mm-hmm. going to back up for just a moment about okay. the uh, the lawnmower being, mm-hmm. you said it was taken down. How far, what was the distance that it carried down to the, uh, you said it was down to a pond or? Oh, I think it was probably moved a good 20 feet. Yeah. And it was facing a different direction and it was upside down and it, it looked dirty. I mean, the seat on it was kind of ruined, you know, the upper part of the seat. Uh-huh. It, we couldn't figure out what the attraction was with it, except that they had already attacked the neighbor lady that used to ride her mower at all hours of the night. They had already attacked her. And oh, I think there's a connection there, it sounds like. And it. I think they didn't want, no, they didn't. Well, also another time my mother got clubbed, she... She wasn't there as much as I was. And, yes, she saw them and all that. But, I mean, she was overwhelmed. She dealt with it differently than I did. I, I could talk about it. And, um, you know, I had a few people in my life that they might have thought I was kind of crazy. But I had a few people in my life that, you know, a couple, couple at church that I could speak with that had similar. Slowly people began to tell me they had similar experiences my mother wouldn't do that. My my mother would just say, oh, poo. Everything was oh, poo. I'd say, uh, Mom, no, 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 don't go out to the car and roll the car windows up by yourself. And sometimes she'd, you know, she's diabetic. She'd leave candy bars and stuff like that stash in the car. And there were times that I think those things were trying to get into the car because they could see something through the window and they could see food. And uh, sometimes she would eat in her car. You know, she she drove long commutes, and if she got hungry or whatever, she would pull over and get a hamburger or whatever and eat it in her car, you know, to make sure her sugars were up so she could get home. God bless her. I tell you what, there must be there must be a crown in heaven for that woman. I tell you, I miss her so bad. She put up with so much in her life, and then for her to try to strike out and have a new life. And have this happen to her, it just seems unfair. But, you know, she took it in her stride. And um, she she wanted to enjoy the yard, naturally. She get to be home on the weekends. Sometimes she spent every day at work and every night with her mother who was dying with cancer. I mean, she really gave it her all. And uh, she she went out. We had been out doing yard work that day in particular, too. And whenever it began to get kind of dark, I looked up at her and I said, I looked her right in the face and I said, come on, we're going in now. And she said, oh, just another minute or two, I want to pick up a few more sticks. And I said, no, the sticks will be there in the morning. She said, this yard has so many sticks. I said, it has so many trees. She said, well, that's where the sticks are coming from. And I said, yes, yes, let's get in the house. Well, they were on the, let's see, Mm -hmm. they were behind the wisteria hedge and I I, I know this is weird, but I kind of felt them rather than directly saw them. And I kind of heard breathing and stuff back there behind the wisteria hedge, which runs all the way diagonally across the property. And it's covered with a wisteria hedge. Oh, it's the greatest thing. It's, I tell you what, when my mother planted wisteria and honeysuckle in there, it's the greatest thing that I could have ever done. My gosh, she did them a great big favor. They love that. They just get right in behind there. You can't, they crouch down. You cannot see them. You cannot, except winter. Well, I went on inside, and I started watching her out my bedroom window, and I slid the window up a little way, and I said, hey, are you going to get in here? And she said, I'm just about through. And I put the window down, and I thought, man, I tell you what, I don't know how I'm going to convince her. And I went in to use the bathroom, and before I got in there good, I heard, oh, I heard her cry out, you know, and uh, I went down the hallway and ran out the front door, and I went out there, and I said, what's the matter? And she said, I don't know what happened. 
and one of them had clubbed her. This was a big, thick, dry stick. We had the sticks out of the yard. The tree she was under, this was a totally different species of tree. I don't know where it came from, but she said that it kind of like she had her back toward the wisteria hedge, and she wasn't going in, I guess, when they wanted her to clear out. And, I mean, they clubbed her, and uh, she had a disfigured back. It really hurt her. It struck her from the back of the head and down on her, down to the bottom of her shoulder blades. I mean, they clubbed her. It knocked her to the ground. Now, they didn't do that much stuff like that to me, but I had them pull my hair and I had them slip up in the dark behind me and touch me a few times, things like that. But they just plain would take advantage of her and shove her down. That's why I wanted her out. That's why I wanted her to move to save herself. And I know that, you know, and like, like you said, who are you going to call, Orkin? We we going to do? I called the police one time, and they said, well, that's not on our jurisdiction. You're technically outside of town. I called the sheriff's department. They said, is it a person? I said, well, it, uh, I don't know, uh, you know how you do. You don't know. Well, yeah, somebody outside with the doorknob. Well, he's got a lot of runs tonight, and if you have any more problems, well, yeah, I have every problem. I, yeah, I have more problems, like, you know, 300 nights a year I have problems, you know, but you can't say that because these things are not supposed to exist. I don't know. I sound cranky, don't I? Well, it's it, I, it's, <laughs> a, it's not un, yeah right right right. It's not uncommon though. We've heard this before, where there's some hesitancy, if especially if they know what's going on. Well, you had this is uh, about four years ago. You had somebody on that you went to school with, and um, a gal. Well, I don't know if you went to school with her, but she's sort of in the same area, and she would call the sheriffs. Mm -hmm. and yeah, we went to the same school. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the deal with that? They're they're a little bit hesitant to come out. Oh yeah, they they always didn't want to come. Mm. Well, I tell you what, it makes me wonder how many of the town folk know, you know, and if and if maybe they haven't had run-ins in the past, you know. But I understand when they say I'm outside of the limits, but I mean just a few miles, you know, and basically all they can do, I mean, I've thought this through, believe me, <laughs> I've had plenty of nights listening to them knocking and scratching at the glass and drinking out of my bird bath and all the other things that they do, and they handle everything you touch. I don't know if you've heard of other people having that problem, but everything I touch, they've got to handle it. Oh, that's real interesting. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I don't know if I've heard. Well, have you heard of anything like that where they do this sort of thing? Is sort of a behavior of theirs, or um, I can't think offhand. Mhm. Mm yeah, but well, I have a theory. My theory is I was the one that was handling the kitchen waste and putting it in the compost, and I don't know how good their sense of smell is, but I could go out there and pot a plant and. The next day, the plant would be upturned. They would sift all through it. Uh, I had uh, one container that had these pretty glass pellets in it. And once in a while, I would wash the glass pellets off and, you know, just walk the dust off of them or whatever. I always was picking up glass pellets. They were fascinated with these things or something. Um, sometimes it even made me wonder if they had rolled them around in their mouth and spat them out. Um, the worst well, there's thing a thought. they did. That, that, what, what, that, that, yeah, there's a there's a kind of a uh, unsavory thought, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you know, I'm bending down and picking these things up and thinking, what is this on here? Uh, they drink the they drink the syrup out of the hummingbird feeders. I mean, my thinking was, I'm going to fill the hummingbird feeders late at night, and then early in the morning, you know, before I really want to get out and put on sugar spray and stuff they'll have the hummingbirds we had hummingbirds lousy 
at the time. And uh, my mother enjoyed that so much, so I kept them cleaned and filled for her. And you'd fill them up thinking, oh, there, now, the birds drank, you know, this amount. And then I'll go ahead and fill them up tonight and hang them back up. And we hung them high. We got these big shepherd hooks. Well, these big black shepherd hooks, my mother saved up to get them. She loved that. And then we had them stuck in the ground there along that wisteria fence, okay? tall fence and with wisteria on it I mean it was high it was high as higher than my head and so uh you know in the night hummingbird feeders would be either they'd be off of there so I went to the store they said well go go into your farm and home store and get some of this axle grease kind of stuff and put that on those hooks didn't change a thing they said maybe it's raccoons climbing the climbing up those things well you know what they got sick and tired I think and I'm assuming here, I think those creatures got sick and tired of running into those shepherd hooks in the night because they smashed them down flat to the ground. They stomped them flat to the ground, every one of them. So I was hanging the hummingbird feeders up in the trees and using a long pole to hang them really high because I kept thinking maybe I can hang them high enough to where you know, something won't climb up there and get it. I could never hang it high enough, and in the morning, They'd be all, you know, like covered with saliva and all the little ports would be off of them and they'd be laying on the ground empty or else sometimes they'd just tip them. I think they were just tipping them back and drinking them, drink, just drinking right out of there. Oh, I'm uh, sure of it. They were, they were swelling it down, uh, Tom, I'm telling you. Uh, and, Will, here, here's the thing. Um, the first time I really heard one of them speak at where I'm living is I had taken down the hummingbird feeders for the year because, you know, on about mm, October 16th is you're not going to see any hummingbirds here after that. So I just take them on down, clean them, put them, you know, put them away and that's, I'm done with that. Well, I had taken them down and put them away and a couple of days later, uh, you know, I, I kept thinking, gosh, I feel like I feel like one of them's back there. I would, I would, I didn't go outside. I felt like one of them was hanging around close at, at the backyard behind that wisteria fence, and so I didn't hang around outside much. And uh, there, the night came, and was at her end of the trailer, and I was at the south end there, where the, where the feeder, where we had a bracket, and we had one of the feeders right there on the corner of the home where my head was, where I slept where my head, you know, right where my headboard was. And in the middle of the night, I heard something very loud, very tall. It was up high. The voice was up high. And I heard, like, two hands pound on the corner of the home, one wall with one hand and the other wall with the other hand. It was standing at the corner and it had such a reach that it was reaching, you know, like toward my window on one side and clear around the corner on the other side of the building and patching the building pretty hard with the hands at the same time. And and it sounded like it was mum, mumbly, but it sounded kind of like, well, this. I hope nobody takes this wrong. But it does. It sounded like someone maybe with a severe case of uh, retardation. Uh, I couldn't understand the language, but it sounded like a language, and they were. It sounded like this voice was begging. It sounded like it was. It, it was kind of like, uh, <laughs> and patting like it like uh, like it was like someone having a tantrum and begging, like you know. The only thing I could think was the hummingbird feeders. Yeah, I, I bet have to it tell was. You something. I have to tell you something funny, too, Well, before I, before I forget. My mom had purchased a, she got in on a big grocery deal somewhere, and she got like a five-pound bag full of pitted prunes. And she had snacked on those, and I said, you brought that whole sack out here. She says, yes. She said, uh, I said, well, you're not going to eat the whole five pounds. I know that for sure. And we were laughing about it. Well, we went inside, and she forgot to take her prunes with her. Each prune was individually wrapped. Okay, now, whatever 
ate the prunes, ate every single prune, and had not chewed them up like a raccoon or a possum would do. Uh, looked to me like they grasped each wrapper by the end like a person would do. You know, you put the candy in your teeth and then kind of bite down and pull the wrapper out of your mouth. That's how all of them were. They were all stripped out like that. Yeah, I bet. Wow. Um, well, weird. listen, Carol, weird. we're going to we're gonna have you back again. Uh, we're going to wrap it up at this point. We've uh, just about run out of time. But uh, I want to get you back on again for a follow-up. This is absolutely fascinating. At the same time, it's... Um, you know, it's a little bit uh, kind of an unfortunate situation for you. So um, it is, but, uh, but I'll tell you what I I'm, I appreciate your having me on, and I appreciate my chance to tell this and uh, to you know I'm you know a person goes through all kinds of feelings. You know, when this thing goes on for years, you go through all kinds of you know self doubt. You feel crazy. You you're you're terrified right now. I'm, I'm just pretty much at the terrified state. Carol, uh, but I stay, appreciate you having me. Carol, we appreciate it. And stay with us just a minute, will you? I, I need to talk to you. Okay. All right, folks. Stay tuned for the next segment. Welcome back from the break, everyone. We have a, an update today. We have Norma, Bob, and Lisa joining us. And I'm just going to turn the microphone over to you guys. Hi, guys. <clears throat> hey, guys. Hey, how's it going? Going good. Good, good. good. So hey, let's hear what, what, what do you guys, what, uh, what's new and what updates do you have for us? Uh, Lisa and I finally met in person <laughs> and after what two years Lisa two, after two years yeah after two years she spent the weekend with us last weekend and prior to her coming which you know anytime that she goes out or anytime that we go out we're always telling each other and talking to each other and giving each other all our you know current events and all of that good stuff. <clears throat> so prior to her coming, um, you know, we've moved from Massachusetts to Connecticut. And we've continued to go to our research area that's in Mass. Um, but we got some new information from the area that we live in now, and which was pretty interesting. So we met uh, a friend of my son-in-law's, his name is Ty, and they live about, his father lives about five miles from us, and Bob had gone and over to his dad's house, they were picking up some, some rocks for a retaining wall, and uh, Bob was asking him about metal detecting and, and some um, cellar holes that were in the, the woods nearby <clears throat> and that Ty had told them about. And Bob said he'd like to go, you know, at some point. And Ty said, well, we've been going out there with four wheelers, you know, pretty much our whole childhood and into adult. And he said, it's pretty creepy out there. <laughs> and Bob said, well, what do you mean creepy? Now, Bob had never mentioned anything to Ty, we had never said anything to him about, uh, you know, doing any kind of Bigfoot research or anything like that. All he was talking about, all Bob was talking about was metal detecting. So when Bob asked him that question, he said, well, you know, Bigfoot stuff. <laughs> and Bob was like, what do you mean Bigfoot stuff? And he said, well, you know, like sounds and sightings and things like that so they got into a conversation about you know the stuff that had was going on around there and Ty had told him 
you know, some stories. One of them was about a uh, camp, uh, what is it, um, like a camping place um, that had had some sightings. So Bob came home and told me about, you know, all of this stuff. And I said, well, that's interesting. He said, Ty said that we could go to his dad's place at any time. You know, we could just go there because Bob had told him he'd like to research the area and see, you know, what was going on. So we decided to go uh, one night and it was the Wednesday. It was last last Wednesday, right? Uh, pretty much for our first time. And where where uh, Ty's dad lives, we have to be it's a private road. Uh, it's dirt and it's very rugged, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, it's in, in, the, in the middle of nowhere, woods. Yeah, basically. Um, and so the road is pretty rough. It's a dirt road. It's pretty rough. And then when you get up, you have to go in for probably, what would you say, Bob, like a, a, maybe a mile? Well, at least a mile straight in the woods. Yeah. yeah about a mile into just to get to his, again, dirt driveway, if you want to call it a driveway, or, or it, it's just a shoot. It, it, it's actually an end. It's actually a dead end kind of a road because um, when you get to the end, you go to the right and you go to, to Ty's dad's house, which is another long you know, road to his house, and there's a lake. And then if you were to go s continue straight, which is um, the four-wheeler road, and that's extremely rough. <laughs> so right in that area, by the four-wheeler path and by uh, Ty's dad's road to go to his house, that's where we parked. We just kind of parked there. So I, you know, I wasn't really expecting anything to happen honestly I was just I was like well you know we might as well go I mean we're five miles away from our house basically we're basing it on secondhand stories right. too so we didn't know the area we didn't know the truth to any of it so you know being investigators we figured hey why not it's five miles away why not you know so that's what we did. We went there that night. We got there about midnight or so. And, you know, it's the general stuff that's going on. Um, you hear the little animals in the woods and what have you. And um, we kind of chit-chatted a little bit. And, again, not really, I guess, Bigfoot related, but we were just kind of sitting there with the, you know, with our recorders on. And about probably about 15 minutes in from when we got there, uh, a rock was thrown. <laughs> so we were like, huh, <laughs> uh, okay. Not a, pebble, a rock. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, you know, we're used to our other research area where they throw little pebbles at us, you know. Are you, are you referring to me? Yeah. Okay, that was before Lisa got there. That was before Lisa got. Oh, no, that's not my chance. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was Wednesday. That was Wednesday. Wednesday Lisa came on Friday. We went out Friday night and Saturday night. So. We're, get, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. You got to preface it with something. <laughs> so um, that rock was thrown, and, you know, we kind of were like, huh, <laughs> what? Okay, this is this is a whole nother you know, area, a whole nother, um, yes, there were, you know, we, we, we talked about, oh, let me go back a little bit. Let me back up a little bit. Where, didn't we go there on Wednesday? We went, actually went there on Wednesday during the day. Um, my son-in-law had gotten a hold of Ty's dad, and Bob wanted to go out metal detecting that afternoon into some of those cellar holes. So we had gotten to, um, uh, I'm sorry, my son-in-law got a hold of him. And then my son-in-law came in and told us that mm -hmm. his dad said, that was his dad said, come on. Yeah, it was, 
I'm sorry, it was Thursday. I take that back. It was Thursday. And um, so we went over there, and Ty's dad started to tell us. We had asked him, hey, my son-in-law said you mentioned something about a guy that you knew that was having Bigfoot activity at a place that he worked nearby where Sam lives. And so we asked him when we went there, With we, we just because my son-in-law had told us what he said, we had gone there and asked him, so what's the story with this guy who has been having activity? So he started telling us about this guy who worked at a mental health um, facility which I think was like a halfway house kind of a, a thing. And he, he told Ty's dad, whose name is Sam, that um, they had all kinds of activity at that, at that halfway house. They had so much activity. They were calling the cops all the time about the Bigfoot activity that was going on there. Well, the workers. Yeah, the workers were, were yes, the workers. <laughs> <laughs> Not the clients. Not the, the clients, workers. the workers. <laughs> so they were calling the cops all the time because of this Bigfoot activity that was going on. This was ongoing. So this is what we found out on Thursday. Now, we had gone there on Wednesday night. Sam didn't know we were there. We were invited there anytime we wanted to go. We didn't need to, you know, tell, it, tell Sam anything. So um, so he, he started to tell, to tell us the stuff. And I said to him, okay. Well, and he said he would get he would get in, a, a t in touch with this guy and have him, you know, call us. We'd, we'd love to talk to him and find out where this was, you know, in reference to um, Sam's house and all of that good stuff. So um, what ended up happening was I said to him, I said to Sam, and his grandson also lives there. I said, so do you guys hear anything? Do you you know, hear any strange noises, uh, you know, at night. And he said, they kind of looked at each other and they're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was like, okay, well, he goes, and, and they, they know a lot of animals out there. You know, they know the sounds of the animals. They, they hear them all the time, you know, a fox, coyotes, all of that stuff. Um, but they also said that they hear they hear noises and they say to each other, hmm, what was that? You know, so they're hearing some some noises that are out there that they can't really identify, which was encouraging. So we got that information from him. We um, got on a four wheeler and we went out actually on that exact a couple paths, I should say. Um, but the exact path that we, uh, at the end of our day, that we went on was the one that was where we were parked that went out behind us. And we took that path with the four-wheeler just to go out there and see what the area looked like and what, you know, possibility there might be out there, you know, for a Bigfoot or maybe several, I don't know, uh, to be out there. And we went quite a ways in. I would have to say, what, Bob, like maybe two miles in. And yep. it's pretty dense forest out there. Um, and we checked everything out, and then we came, we came back, and, you know, we kind of just left. But we thought it was a very interesting area. So when we went there on Wednesday night, this is prior to talking to Sam, we got that rock thrown. Um, there were several other things that happened that night that kind of, you know, changed our opinion of that area. So, of course, the next day I called Lisa <laughs> and we had already planned for her to come out on, you know, Friday and uh, stay the weekend. So I called her and told her what was going to happen or what happened on Wednesday. And then um, when she came out on Friday, we kind of talked about, you know, again, going out on Friday night and going out on Saturday night. And that's exactly what we did. So Friday night we went out. Lisa, you want to you wanna interject here? Uh, I will soon, but start off with what happened. 
Okay, so Friday night we get there, and, you know, we do the normal normal stuff. We're in our van, actually, and um, get the H2s all set up, and I think it was about 15 minutes in. We kind of heard a few branches break, but, you know, it was nothing major, but about 15 minutes in, we heard this, this roar it was kind of a roar yell and bob was like whoa what was that all, all at the same time we said that was a roar <laughs> yeah. yeah that was it, it was i guess it was not i wasn't expecting it i i you know because when we go to our old research area you know, we have Bigfoot that are mute, pretty much. <laughs> I can't say they're always mute. You know, we hear, we do hear vocals here and there, but um, that was a pretty good, that was a pretty good roar sound, right, Lisa? Oh, that was, it, that was really loud. In fact, it sounded really close, which kind of gave us the creeps, and it wasn't the only sounds they ended up making. Um. For instance, when the coyotes went off and then we heard the, um, the screaming sounds after the coyotes, you know, they always say that if it's got an ah sound phoneme at the end of it, um, it's not a coyote. Well, that's what we heard really loud after the coyotes had gone off. Yeah. And what would you call that? A howl? More more of a howl they did twice like that. You mean with the coyotes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was more yeah, that was more of a howl. The other one was that kind of a roar yell and then it went it went silent for a little bit, about I uh, I don't know, like maybe three minutes, and then it did it again, but it was kind of a couple times in succession. It wasn't that long kind of roar the first time we heard it it was more of a kind of you know it sounded like roar bark yeah yeah a couple times and then we didn't hear it again all we heard was like the coyotes you know we and heard the, we heard the, the shuffling in the in the leaves the, the the cracking like something was trying to be very quiet going around on the wooded side there, the shuffling sound. Yeah. We are basically surrounded by woods. We are also surrounded by, I mean, there's a lot, there were, a, there was a lot of rocks, a lot of boulders. boulders. And there were smaller boulders kind of uh, around the perimeter of where we were parked on one side where the road came in and went uh, into Sam's driveway, and then along the side where it was in between the driveway and the four-wheeler path, and then on the other side, you know, where the um, road was that came in. So there were, uh, they, they were, uh, I think they were placed there. Yeah, Sam I think put them Sam, there. Sam put them there, no, you know. There's an excavator. So, um, and they were, you know, they were pretty good size. Not gigantic, but as we went out in the four-wheeler, there well, what was that, Lisa? They were about, that cone-shaped one was about three, at least three feet tall. I mean, that was pretty massive. Yeah, the, yeah, that one was actually, that one came up to my chest. That was a pretty good size uh, boulder there. That one was set. These, these, come, these come into play, these boulders, is the reason we're talking about them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next night. Uh, or no, that was the first night. No, that, that was, was that night. But there are a lot of huge boulders in that area, and there's no uh, lack of rocks, that is for sure. And so when we heard the rock that was thrown the first time, um, when Bob and I went out on Wednesday, it wasn't a pebble. It was a pretty good-sized rock. And that kind of, you know, took us aback a little bit because we're so used to, you know, I mean, on occasion, and I think I've mentioned this before, on occasion, you know, in our old, our other research area, um, 
there's a big rock thrown. Big, I'm talking like tennis ball, you know, so, or, or, or baseball size. But this this guy, you know, this, this rock was bigger. So um, back to Friday night, you know, we're hearing all this, this stuff. And and then um, we're gonna just. It was about all. It was about. We were just listening to the H uh, two. Three thirty seven in the morning. Bob said, "Well, because there was kind of a little lull going on." Bob said, "Well, um, how long do you want to, you know, stay out?" And we we're like, "Well, whatever. Whenever you want to, you know, go." And Bob said, "Well, let's give it till four o'clock." Now this is four o'clock a.m. So about, gosh, I don't know, 10 minutes. It was probably about five of um, four when we were talking a little bit. We were talking, and, and all of a sudden I was like, shh, I hear something. And we all kind of quieted down. And he goes, well, maybe that was Lisa moving. And I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and we kind of just quieted down and we're listening and all of a sudden and Lisa and I were listening to this recording uh I think it was was it Saturday Lisa or Sunday no Saturday Sunday. we listened no Sunday yes yeah, Saturday night when we got back we were listening to it yeah again Saturday, and again yeah we were trying to hear um you know this this specific event that happened so we're sitting there We'll get back to that. We're sitting there and in the car. And all of a sudden we hear a, a, a little twigs break. And Tom and Will, do you guys remember that movie? Or have you ever seen that movie, Princess Bride? Either of you? No, I don't think I've seen that one. It was with Andre the Giant. He was in it. Uh, it was directed by Rob Reiner, I believe. And on one of those part, in one of the parts in the movie, there's this big, huge boulder. And Andre the Giant is out of the scene, and one of the other main characters is by this big boulder. And Andre the Giant throws this other smaller boulder into the other one and makes this huge noise and it sh it kind of shocks you because you don't know what's coming in the in in this particular movie so this is what it sounded like on friday night when we were in the van we heard that maybe some of your maybe picked up a boulder and smashed it on top of the other boulder three feet behind the van and we heard this big chunk of rock come flying off of it almost to the van. That's what it... it I'm sounds, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It, oh, no. No, it, no, it no. Was, it was massive. It. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> it was <It's>, so... <laughs> was so loud. I thought that at first, I thought it ricocheted off the top of the van. Um, you know, kind of slid across the, the roof of the van. But we didn't know where it came from. It was just all of a sudden this, this thing just threw, uh, I don't even know the size of the boulder that it, or the size of the rock that it threw at the boulder, but man. It, it had to be 50 pounds. It was, it was just the, the noise that it made was just, I mean, we, the whole van rocked because we, we all jumped. <laughs> it's probably the so loud part. Yeah, it's probably the loudest thing we ever had on the recorder, ever. Yeah. I mean, it was oh, loud. Oh, yeah, by far. It was so forceful. Get the heck out of me. <laughs> yeah, it was so forceful and so, uh, I mean, <laughs> we definitely weren't expecting that. And it just came out of nowhere and, again, just, just threw it with, such force at this other boulder or that laid it down with his hand one like what? lisa said it was smashed it. yeah one of the two it was it yeah. was crazy there was there was no de i mean there's no denying you know what yeah something with hands <laughs> <laughs> rock on rock yeah it was no boulder on uh, boulder I... exactly <laughs> 
guys, I'm going to ask you. Well, I just I was going to ask a rhetorical that. question, but you're out in the middle of nowhere, right? Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no chance that this was somebody pulling a prank on you. This was no. the creatures. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and sure. by the way, I just wanted to comment. I did see the movie, and it's an excellent movie. So. <laughs> do you know which what, which part I'm talking about? I do. Yeah. You're sitting there, and you don't expect, it, and all of a sudden, bam! It hits that. It hits that boulder. That's exactly how it sounded. When it, it sounded like a 50-pound rock comes smashing down with force on top of a, another boulder and shattering. And uh, a piece about bigger than a grapefruit, probably like a honeydew melon comes, sound comes rolling up to the truck. We thought it, we thought it all hit the, tr the, the van, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah we, we thought the it hit the van because the sounds were so loud when it shattered. Yeah, well, and, didn't. Yeah, and process of elimination. I mean, come on. What else was it, right? I mean, <laughs> no, nobody could have picked up a rock to make that kind of a sound, no, and, and shatter yeah. something like that. No. And we were in the pitch black for four hours. I mean, somebody would have had to navigate some of that with a flashlight. We would have saw light. We were sitting in pitch black. So nobody could do that over four hours later by process of elimination in the dark i mean yeah good point in the yeah in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere <laughs> they would have been stumbling around i mean it, it would have been an easy feat and you're going to wait four hours to do that in the dark uh, yeah it's just with no light it just doesn't make sense not to mention and our worry was the road was so bad that the yeah. if anything more happened how you know there was no way we could drive out of there more than 10 10, 15 miles an hour, that's yeah. how bad the dirt, the dirt that, road into there was. Not with the van. No way. Yeah, There's maybe no way we three would. to five miles an hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that yeah. road is so bad. It's so bad. Um, you know, you have to really go slow even just to get in there with the van. And the van is, you know, it's got a nice wide wheel ba wheel, wheel base and it's it's pretty good, but there's no way that we would be able to make a fast getaway. So that was one of the things. And, you know, can, so that's about five, that was about five, you know, 3.55 a.m. when that boulder happened. Well, that kind of kept us there a little bit longer. And after that, you know, we had heard a couple good-sized branch breaks. And then there was... Um, I think we turned on the light. There was a whistle too, right? Oh in yeah, there. there was a couple. We whistles. heard a couple mm -hmm. very short whistles that we don't know what. Obviously, could have you know I don't know what kind of animal would make it at night, but bird possibly, but they were pretty loud. Uh, you heard them, right, Lisa? The whistles. Yeah, yeah, they weren't birds in the middle of the night like that. They they were two distinct whistles. Yeah, they were short whistles. Um. But, you know, another thought that came to our minds right after that happened is we know our old research area and we kind of feel comfortable there. Not, I guess comfortable is not the right word, but we seem to know kind of what to expect. We kind of been there, going there for, you know, 15 yeah. years. So we kind of get a fair sense of when things get heated, when we should be getting out of there. It's a smoother road. We can get out fast. Um, faster. <laughs> faster. But. Well, things ramped up so fast. Yeah. Well, but, but we did. And you know what? That was after I lit up the whole area. Remember? Yeah. Yes. But, yeah. I guess what I was going to say, too, is that we don't know this demeanor. You know, we don't. We don't un yeah. quite know what to expect. After that rock incident, uh, you know, I mean, how heated things get? How safe are we now? I mean, we just All right. Did we, were, did we just put ourselves in the middle of a a very um, yeah hostile group? Right, we're but in a new area. <laughs> yeah, we we're, it was, there's more of a sense of unexpectedly. You don't, you kind of don't know what to expect. We, you know, here here's the thing. 
this is we're new to this area and and we are new to them so we didn't know how they were going to react to somebody being there that has never happened before no one has ever really done that you know just gone in with a vehicle and just sat there um again we don't know them they don't know us you know it, it's 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 this weird thing that's going on and did that happen after i lit up the area what's that did that happen after i leaned out the window kind of climbed out the window with this with They've got this mega power spotlight, and I lit up all the woods in a 360. Yes, every time there were a couple times that we lit, we lit up, and we just kind of you know looked around. I think it was a couple times after either a rock was thrown or there was um, heavier uh, break, you know, branches breaking. So every time that we would light up, which is like I said, only the a couple times, only once before we lit up the second time when Lisa took the spotlight out. Um, every time we shut the lights back off, it seemed like they, you know, came alive again. You know, they, they, they would. They reacted. Right. They reacted to, they didn't, obviously didn't want us, you know, putting the lights on or something. So uh, the second time, you know, we gave Lisa the spotlight and she, we rolled down the window, and she was out the window looking basically around. Um, I think that was before we got the boulder. It was. We got the boulder, we got the boulder shortly after that. that. Right. Yeah, we listened to the recording last night, and that was, it's true what you said. You lit up first, yep. and then that incident with yep. the rock shortly thereafter. Yeah, it was about probably after that, it was probably about a half an hour after that when we shut everything down again and just kind of sat there and talked about when we were going to leave. So after that happened, um, you know, we were a little concerned because <laughs> we didn't know where it came from. We didn't know if it hit it across the van, you know, roof. We, we were a little concerned. We thought about leaving at that point, and then we didn't. So after that happened, um, we heard, was it the owls that came? Oh, yeah, maybe it was the whistles. The whistles, the whistles. came. It was the whistles. It was yeah. the two whistles that we heard. And shortly after that, it was that weird <laughs> sound. You I mean, not make owls sound. And it went, it, it did, it was very close. And it wasn't. Uh, who cooks for you? You know, <laughs> it, it, no. <laughs> it, yeah. it definitely, it was this I, weird, you know, very strong and it kind of went, woo, it kind of went, woo, ah, you know, it was weird. Yeah. I, I went on YouTube today and, and I was trying to pick out barred owl sounds and just by way of comparison. And I'll tell you what, everything I heard was nothing close to that. I mean, I was even trying to stretch it a little. Like maybe it's a different, you know, uh, breed of owl. Who knows? But couldn't find anything uh, to that sound as far as it being a real owl. I mean, I, I, maybe it was a sick one. But other than that, I, yeah. you know, as it was sick, it 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 was a strange sound. It wasn't it anything. Go a I, long way to get me to think that was an owl. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find I couldn't find the sound on each. I put on. Plenty of calls from owls, and I nothing compared. And we've heard we've heard plenty of barred owls, you know. Oh yeah. Ooh, 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 you know we we and and sometimes they do off you know off uh, sounds, but this was totally weird. It was different. It was ooh wah, and then at the end it would be that wah. <laughs> and where's that? What is that? You know, where yeah, does that come Lisa's from? barred owl call was more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> the one you made. Yeah, when she, oh, when yeah. She out the window, yeah. I did a bug owl call out the window. So after the owl, it, and it did it several times, but it was, you know, spaced in between a little bit. And then at the end of it, it went quiet again. And then there was this high pitch kind of a howl thing um, at the very end. 
So, I, again, don't, don't know what that was either. So that was Friday night. Well, that got us pretty that, much. Is that when I joked, made the joke, what if I just jumped out of the car waving my hands going booga, booga, booga? <laughs> 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 when that, that thing was right there with that rock, could no, you imagine you seeing the look on his face? No, that was but Saturday. They wouldn't let me. And no. no, you were getting a little too crazy <laughs> Saturday night, you know. Girl. No. I wanted to liven things up a little. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll the, get the to that. The snapping of bones, in my yeah. estimation, isn't livening things up. <laughs> you don't want to listen back on that on the age that's Definitely wouldn't be anything not. on a recording of yeah so, no <laughs> lisa said you know um brett well when that whole you know boulder thing happened she was like you can't pay me to get out of the car and then <laughs> after howls you know she's like well do you guys want to leave in case they do anything else <laughs> <laughs> so, and this, this is about 4.30 in the morning. So we had stayed a little longer than, you know, we had said at the beginning. So now fast forward, you know, we talk about it the next day, which was Saturday. And we listened to the H2, Lisa and I, after we got back. But Saturday night, we go out again. But this time, we aren't bringing our, you know, soccer mom van. We, we brought... <laughs> my son-in-law's huge truck. Um, yeah, it's a diesel Cummings uh, yeah. Dodge Ram. It's a Dodge. It's a Dodge Ram, pretty good sized truck, and we're like, we're going big this time because <laughs> we <laughs> we need to get out of there anytime, you know, quick. Uh, we need something that's going to handle this road. And I had also said, to Bob, you know, rather than trying to get out through the road regardless if it's in, you know, the Ram or if it's in our van or anything else. Um, I said, we might as well just go to Sam's house. It's a lot shorter yeah. <laughs> than trying to navigate that, that, you know, bumpy, rocky road. So we decided that any time that we go out there from here on in, if anything, um, you know, it's out of hand. yeah, if anything yeah. gets crazy, um, you know, we're going to head right to, you know, Sam's house, which is far less. Yeah, it's of a quarter a, mile. Yeah, it's um, about a quarter mile. So far yeah. less than trying to navigate that other road. Because Bigfoot would be running alongside us. There's no <laughs> doubt. Uh, especially if we are in the van. Yeah. So Saturday, we all get ramped up to go. And uh, we ended up going around the same time of night, setting everything up. And again, more activity, but it was a little bit different on Saturday night. It, they they didn't throw as many rocks as they did, you know, Wednesday and, and Friday night. Uh, definitely, we were we were ready for anything that <laughs> might have happened. Not to mention, we were in a, a totally different vehicle, so that could have incited, you know, some crazy activity we weren't sure what was going to happen so trying to remember the the kind of the chronological event, event sequence and it's hard because we were there friday night and saturday night we know some of the things that definitely happened on friday night and they kind of mesh with each other so we got there and there were there was activity there were more branches being broken and lisa you said something about Something about a tree. What was that? What was that branch you were talking about? Sound? Oh, yeah, like a, a big, huge branch that had lots of smaller branches. Sounds like it got ripped down and was being torn apart. The the multiple breakings. Yeah. Off to the front to the front of the van. It sounded like in the woods to the front of the to the front of the. Uh, I'm sorry, the truck sounded like a big branch got ripped down and was being torn apart. Yes. Uh, and it, to me, you know, we were having sounds that were happening, like, very close to us and then off in the distance. 
So we had things going on. And what was that one, the shuffling? We heard the shuffling walk. Yes. I believe that, that was, was prior to the, 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 all the branch breaking fuss that went on. Yeah, we weren't sure if it was walking fast or what it was doing because I think we turned the van lights on <laughs> and <laughs> hearing things around us. And then we were hearing things. We heard, um, what was that that we heard off in the distance? Like a, a, a howl, a couple of few howls that were off in the distance that weren't, mm -hmm. um, again, weren't coyotes, but they weren't, again, mm -hmm. You know, we definitely had something going on uh, right by us. And I don't know if you, I, I didn't talk to you about this, Lisa, but it sounded like there were multiple, not multiple, but maybe a couple different areas where we were that things were happening. Like you had mentioned just a minute ago it about hearing it in front of the van or, or, I mean, the truck kind of off, you know, to the side front the of right. the and then we we're hearing yeah. things on a in a different area. Uh, same where we were, close, but a different area. And then we we're hearing like the howl things, you know, off a little bit further away. Yeah. And again, they ended with that ah sound, which coyotes can't make, the ah phoneme. At the end of the screen, there was always an ah. There was definitely higher pitched ah, like it, it kind of started really high and then it went low which is just kind of um, weird kind of opposite of what you normally hear yeah very very strange sounds off in the distance uh, that the first night when we heard that uh, roar that was that was very close that wasn't off in the distance. That was pretty dang close. No, that was really close to the van. Yeah, that was that was very the, deep. Uh, we rocked that van. We jumped so all of us jumped out of our seats. That was the, yeah. That was one of the first things that happened, other than a few little toy breaks before before that um, on yeah. that on that night, but. Yeah. It was same memo, kind of hearing little walks, little sticks cracking, and before a big event. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting because Lisa and I were talking about it. We we listened to that boulder, um, that rock that was thrown at the boulder, mm -hmm. several times. We also listened to the the roar several times, and but with the with the rock that hit the boulder, you could hear a, almost like a step prior to it you know yeah exactly I, I forgot about that it was like sneaking up but then that last step before it smashed that boulder you heard the definitive step of it and then the smash and it yeah. was very audible almost like it was at that point concentrated on throwing the rock and and didn't pay attention to his last step and made a very loud step yeah, that's, that was pretty interesting. Then Lisa got a little, so, so there was a lull, okay? In, the, in between, you know, the activity at the beginning, and then there was kind of a lull. And Lisa said, well, maybe we should light up. Every time we light up, they do something, you know, and we shut off, you know, lights, they do something. So we tried that, and we got a little bit, I think we got maybe, what, some branches broken or really not much so no. <laughs> Lisa said well what if I get out of the truck and go walking up the road I'm like are you out of your mind <laughs> I wanted to <laughs> with that big light but I got yeah. shot down here's the thing okay <laughs> She, we're, both Bob and I are like, yeah, we don't, we don't think that's a good idea because if anything were, and I talked to you about this too, Lisa, right? Yesterday. Mm -hmm. yeah. If anything happened, especially after the night before where that big boulder was thrown, I mean, 
seriously, they could have very easily have thrown that boulder at us. It was. Oh, sure. No it was doubt. Three feet behind us. Yeah, basically. Yeah, to begin with. We don't know if it was behind us because there was, like I said, there were boulders all around us. So it could have been any one of those, those well, boulders. Being in, the, being in the far back, that's, that's where it sounded like to me. I mean, it, you're right. It could have been anywhere, but being in the back, it, it certainly sounded like it came from back by those um, big high cone boulders. And then when the, the uh, cantaloupe-sized rock came rolling. You could hear that rolling across the um, dirt road yeah. after the smash. It certainly yeah. sounded like it was rolling towards the rear of the van, of the did, truck, I'm sorry. Yeah, it did sound like it was behind us, but, you know, it, um, because that, because the H2 is omnidirectional, it's, sometimes it's, you can tell an area where it might be coming from, and sometimes you you feel like it's behind you. But like I was saying, you know, like we were talking about yesterday, um, sometimes your brain just says it's behind you <laughs> because everything seems to be <laughs> behind you, you know. It's behind you. Run. <laughs> um, I, I don't honestly. Yeah, the, roar, the roar wasn't behind us. The roar was in front of us. <laughs> Yeah, the roar was crazy. But again, it did sound like it was behind us, but I can't I can't say for sure where there. Yeah. I know it was close. So wherever it was, it was close. Um but you know, Bob and I are like, No, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think you should be <laughs> walking out on the dirt road. <laughs> that, if anything were to happen to her and we have the headlights on, and we're watching her walk down this road, and she gets torn apart by a Bigfoot. That would scar us for life. There would be nothing to do about it. Not that that would happen. I'm just saying. <laughs> if something like that would happen. Yeah, some people wonder why we stay in the van. There's a reason. <laughs> we're just, you can keep on thinking, but. Safety first. <laughs> you know, and it's... Yeah. It, it, yeah, to have that kind of ramped up, you know, activity. My group here that I study, I mean, they're very... Um, predictable. What's the word? Yeah, they're very predictable. They don't, you know, aside from the one that ran past the tent and the two marks saw in front of the tent. Um, That's you know, like our normally... Yeah, that's like our old research area. They're predictable. We kind of, other than the bluff charge, like you said, there's there's the uh, yeah. there's the occasion, but all in all, yeah, you know, feel like you kind of know what's going on. I mean, I don't think yeah. anybody has a handle on what these things are doing, but you know, you, no. like it's, you, you get accustomed to when things are heated and when it's it's just time to leave. You know, we've done that, and it's yeah. not like not of the you know any of the vehicles at any point in time we have gotten out of the vehicles many times during oh, you yeah. know activity oh yeah but we've we had also, we've had excursions and and expeditions and we've we've hiked through the woods with no headlamps on so back in our younger days and <laughs> foolish days uh no i mean no we, weapons no nothing just hiking we've still we've still done it you know up to what we were out with fred and mark uh, that a few time, that weeks night. ago, yeah. Um, yeah. But once again, this is all new to us. This whole area, this this group. I mean, we don't know. We don't There's know a lot. To, we don't know what to expect. That's right. We don't know what to expect. Well, especially since there there seemed to be a perceived aggressiveness right off the bat. That's what right. kind of alar alarmed us a little bit. Neither of us are in our normal research areas have a group that that's anywhere near you know with the exception of the bluff charge you guys got you know and there was a reason for that um you know none of us have experienced that type of aggression right off the bat perceived aggression yeah hey bob lisa yeah. and and norma a uh, quick question did you guys get a count 
of how many creatures are in the area, how big how big a group it is, uh, that sort of thing. No. Yeah. No, but we definitely have- more than one. We we could tell one night that was probably yeah. probably a minimum of two. We the could, minimum of two, I can tell you that. Yeah, at least two in that particular, at least that and one. It, and it, well, in the immediate. And it, didn't seem to be, and it didn't seem to be the typical juvenile activity that both of us uh, have um, experienced with our groups. You know, pebble throwing or the running past my tent, you know, I saw the shadow outlined kind of hunched over running past the tent like gee what can like a teenager what can i get away with without really interacting with them this was a, a whole new ball game this this was yeah very close very loud very big show i think of either strength or intimidation yeah. if, if how many times in total have you guys been out in this new area we, Bob and I went out, three. well, oh, yes. well three we, went, we went out one time at the very, very, very beginning where it was too windy and we couldn't stay there. So we, we didn't experience anything. Oh, we just yeah. kind of went out oh. there and just to get a feel of the area and what have you. And then, you know, we left pretty, pretty quickly after that because the wind was, you know, it was just too windy. Um, but the first, I guess real research time that we went out there was that Wednesday. And that's when we got the rocks thrown. Um, yeah, this is all just like three times total. Yeah, three. Total, so. three to yeah. The- and then I was there the last two times, Friday night and Saturday night, exactly. when it ramped up. So we don't know what to expect. I mean, we kind of do now. We don't know if they're they're going to get accustomed to us we don't know if they're going to continue to be but as far as a group uh, big, a more aggressive a group. we don't know how we don't have i big can of a say group. though that saturday night it seemed like there were some, there was something off in the distance and there were a couple around us immediately around us mm-hmm. so at least two to know. Mm-hmm. yeah at mm-hmm. least yeah, there were a couple points you could tell there were different sounds coming from different directions happening at the same time as subtle as they were, you you could hear the the walking, and that was immediately around us. Yeah, while something in the far away was happening as well. I mean, the house, the screaming, the the fake owl screaming. Yeah. Well, this place is very huge and remote. We'll have to uh, get a hold of you, Tom, and let you, you know, get a Google Earth type search of it. It's it's. Uh, Sam told me that you could ride a four-wheeler on these trails out there and go out all afternoon and not even be on the same trail. So Never be on the same trail it, twice. Yeah, it's, well, it's, Bob, you took the words out of my mouth. That's kind of where I was going was just how vast is this area? And it sounds like it's uh, a pretty vast wilderness area. Is that right? It is. It, it yeah. Borders, it's, yeah. It, it borders a couple state forests. Well, probably more than a couple. Um and when we were out in the four wheelers, we had gone in, like I said, about two miles. And we, at one point when we were in there, there was a sign. And, and, and like I said, it was weird to see the sign out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it said a conservation. It said something about a conservation area. So also, in addition to state forests, there's a conservation area right behind where we were. Not probably, a, what, about a mile in? Was yeah, really we'll have to time. research, see how big that is. But mm-hmm. and we yeah, were did, pretty close do they have the restrictions? And the Rhode Island border. Right. right. Um, I but think just, no, I didn't, didn't see, see any restrictions. Yeah, we didn't see any restrictions. No, not like four-wheelers or anything like that. Matter of fact, it's a popular four, uh, four-wheel area. It's, it's, I think they ride four wheelers out there and dirt bikes. Um, but there's not, I mean, I think we could probably manage it with my son-in-law's truck, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty nasty, gnarly roads out there. 
and there's big dips, you know, where there's basically pools of water that unless you have yeah, something. They're, they're not roads. They're, they're quad tracks. Yeah, yeah, it's not roads. No, no, it's, no they're not roads. They're, 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 all woods. They're, 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 they're not, they weren't made as roads. They were made by the quads. Yeah, and that's a lot. Like I said, Sam lives there. He's very knowledgeable. He lived there his whole life. He said, you'll never be on the same trail. So it's got to be, it's gotta be pretty big. But it's got to be huge. Well, just the parcel we were on was about 175 acres, right? And that's just the owned land. That's not the conservation area or the um, state forest or anything. I think part of that is the conservation area and the state forest. Uh, Sam oh, owns okay. 11 acres around him. There's this huge lake behind his house. Um, and then, again, like I said, you know, state forests that are all around there. And there's also, you know, camping um, places around there as well. One of them being uh, what Ty was talking about, having, you know, Bigfoot activity. Are those primitive camps? I never asked. Um, I, I'm not sure. No, I don't think so. I, I don't, I don't know. I have we, to. We've got to get the name of the camps. Yeah, grounds. we have to get a hold of Ty again. And yeah, try once to... again, we're new to this whole area. So we're, we're just learning. We're just kind of thankful that, you know, all this is happening just, you know, 10 minutes from our house. So, you know, we don't have to travel far to research. We're kind of glad about that being researchers. We're not going to give up our old research area. We are still going to be active there as well but when we can't go there which is what an hour and a half away an hour, 15, um, an hour and a half. you know we we're very happy that this actually you know came up it, it's pretty interesting um so far <laughs> may not be saying that in, in a month or so <laughs> It is. I'm not going to lie. It's unnerving. Um, you know, going to a new place, trying to figure out whether you're going to come out alive. Or not. That's why we're going big. You know, when we bring a vehicle, we're going big. So, uh, whether it's, you know, giving well, us. I think you can still rip the door off of that just as easily as the van. So, <laughs> I think it's perceived, perceived comfort. I was just going to say, it's more feeling like we're a little more safe than, you know, being crumpled in the van or rolled. <laughs> maybe, maybe it would take a little bit more to, you know, right. tip the truck a <laughs> And the truck is much higher. And I don't know if that's better or not, because because the truck is so much higher, I'm feeling like I might be looking face to face for the big foot. <laughs> Some night, you know, right in my window. So I don't know if that's good or bad, honestly. Well, one night. <laughs> I'm looking at his belly button. There's a few of them one night for sure because they are they seem pretty active in this area. So I think one of these times we're going to light it up or swing that light out into the woods. We're going to have something right there. Because all these rock crashing and sounds there, <laughs> I said they're close. So and like I said, these, these, they don't seem know. to care. They don't have a lack of rocks. I mean, these rocks that they're throwing are not little pebbles. They, they're, they're good size, you know. I, I, I mean, the, probably the size of a baseball kind of size rocks that they're throwing. They're not. I haven't heard a pebble yet. <laughs> not, not even yeah. one yet. Right, which lead, led me to believe they're probably adults, especially you know with that boulder smashing and then ripping that branch off that tree. You know, I, I don't get the sense that we're dealing with juvenile, typical juvenile activity when we're out there. It, it no. definitely sounded big and forceful. There's, there's no doubt. We, I mean, the only time that I've ever heard anything that loud was when we got that wood knock. Uh, wow. When I told you that this Louisville hit that tree, this, is but this was this wow. was definitely wow. different. It wasn't, you know, something hitting a tree. This thing was powerful. It just yeah, it was, it was a display rock. of power. For yeah. Sure, that's a good. Put it. Yeah. Want to let us know who was boss? Basically, I think. 
or get us out of it. Yeah. Intimidation, definitely. But they're not doing, I mean, so far, they're not hitting us. You know, they're not, thankfully, they're not. We should check with our insurance. Right. (laughs) Well, listen, guys. There um, There were no specific direct hits that they were purposely, you know, aiming to hit us, but they certainly were very close to hitting us, and they could have at any time very easily. Well, yeah. listen, it sounds like you guys have an exciting new group out there, and I think we're going to be getting a lot more updates from you guys. So um, we're about out of time, but I really appreciate it. I always get excited when I hear that we've got an update from Bob, Norma, and Lisa. Um, you guys get some great activity out there. Yeah, we really do, and this is all new. So, yeah, we'll certainly want to keep you updated. Absolutely. Please. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this one up. And thanks again. Oh, thank, you. Um, well, thank you, guys. Good talking with you again. Thank yeah, you, thanks. Lisa. Yeah. So much. Thanks, Lisa. Norma. All right. Thanks, Bob. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. These eight stories are a collection being brought to you by William Jevening and are being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story 1. Sasquatch Story. Sonoma County, California. Sonoma County, California. Just a story. Terrifying screams heard. No sighting. July 1980. Well, I have collected enough information from various Bigfoot sites about screams to conclude that I heard a Sasquatch on a bicycle touring trip from Portland, Oregon to Santa Barbara, California in the summer of 1980. My girlfriend and I arrived at Fort Ross Historical Park north of Jenner, California in Sonoma County on an evening in mid-July. We decided to camp there at Fort Ross as it was marked as a campsite on our map but it had no campsites. There was no one at the main house, nor around the fort, old Russian fur trading fort, or on any part of the grounds. We rode to a campground further south, but it was too expensive. We decided to ride back to Fort Ross. We camped to the left of the upper parking lot under some Monterey pines next to a picnic bench. We ate dinner and went to bed at around 9 p.m., At approximately 1 a.m., a scream 20 feet to the left of the tent, our heads were facing the ocean, a blood-curdling scream of various sounds in succession that lasted at least nine seconds. It frightened me to my bone marrow. I froze in fear, knowing that whatever made the sound was huge. It was so close, I could hear the tremor in its throat. Since I'm a musician, I realize how much force it takes to make a sound that loud. I've also been camping all my life, and have heard various animals, but this was different. I have been told it was a bear or a mountain lion, but I don't think so. Anyway, my girlfriend said in a whisper, What the frick was that? I started to reach for a flashlight, and her hand grabbed my wrist with a vice-like pressure so I didn't move. We remained frozen, listening to every little noise for an hour. Incidentally, there were sheep running free everywhere, going, ba ba, and they didn't stop making noise when the scream occurred. Finally, my girlfriend fell asleep, and I remained on guard with my hands hovering around the tent pole to use as a weapon, thinking that at any moment it would stick its fanged head into our tent. At around 2.30 a.m., I guess, I heard another scream down by the fort in the lower parking area. I figured it wasn't coming back, so I fell asleep. It didn't occur to me the next morning that it was a Sasquatch, so I didn't look for footprints, nor did I hear it walking the night before. This is the end of story one. Story number two. A story from Tehama County, California. Summer, 1977, 
12 o'clock a.m. No sighting, just an odd occurrence. Nearest town, Chester, Highway 36 at Lost Creek Road. Willow Springs Campground in the Mount Lassen National Forest. Directions, take Highway 36 out of Red Bluff, then Wilson Lake Road to First Right. The road number is 29 North 18. It leads right into Willow Springs Campground, Lassen National Forest at 530-595-4444. My grandpa, my uncle, and I have been working in the area picking up sugar pine and digger pine cones for about three days or so, and had planned on being there for around a week. We were camped in a lower campsite in this campground, just off the main cinder road coming by the camping area. I remember the camp was right next to a creek, and each night we would hear the deer coming down to the creek to water, and would occasionally shine our flashlights and see them drinking. One particular night, we were sitting around relaxing, and I commented that it was strange that we didn't hear any deer in the creek. In fact, I don't recall even hearing any crickets or any of the usual nighttime noises. There was a group of people camped above us about 100 yards or so up the hill, and they hadn't been there camping as long as we had. The three of us could hear the people in the camp talking and such. Then it was quiet. Suddenly, someone in the upper camp shouted, Hey! Then some loud talking, and then this growl, scream noise. It was very loud and sounded as if it came from a fairly large animal. My uncle and I looked at each other, asking each other what the heck that noise was. And we looked at my grandpa, who was smiling and chuckling, which I found to be very odd unless it was to cover up being frightened himself. My grandpa was a retired logger from Oregon. My uncle had also spent considerable time in the woods, working as well as hunting most of his life. I had spent a lot of time in the woods, also hunting and working for my uncle, but had never heard a sound like that, nor had the rest of us. My grandpa said he thought it was probably a bobcat or cougar, but my uncle and I had never heard any animal make that kind of sound not to mention the fact that those animals will most likely stay away from a loud camp and may venture closer when it is dark and quiet. Anyway, while we were wondering what the first noise was, there began a lot of hollering and another loud growl scream from the upper camp. Vehicle doors slamming and then the vehicle took off down the road, tires throwing cinders. They were out of there but fast. We, my uncle and I, were shaken up but too proud to admit it to my grandpa. We didn't hear anything else from the upper camp. Nothing. I don't know if they left anything up there, but, or how they were camped or anything. I do know that they didn't come back. We went to bed as it was getting late, and I was so afraid to make any sound, fearful that it would hear me breathing and come into camp to investigate. We left a couple of days later, but I don't recall hearing a deer in the creek in the evenings after that night. All of the information given here is to the best of my recollection. As for the terrain, it was heavily wooded pine forest, quite a bit of brush around the creek area. That's the end of story number two. Story number three. Weaverville, Trinity County, California. A young grocery clerk in Weaverville, Trinity County, took me to a point at which he came upon a light-colored Sasquatch during the winter of 1994. It was not far from Big Bar Ranger Station, where he and his girlfriend used to park and neck after work. Engaged in some heavy petting, they were interrupted by the rocking motion of his Chevy Camaro. They looked around, thinking it was one of their friends or other kids screwing around with them, but the windows were pretty fogged up. There was little visibility. Determined to confront the intruder, the young fellow bounced out of the Camaro, screaming, Knock it off! in a most assertive tone, only to find himself face to face in the pitch dark with a hulking figure he described as a bit taller than he was. Stunned, the kid backed up into the open car door, unable to move. He said the Bigfoot, with his left fist, wailed on the roof of his Camaro, beating it at least three times, but barely denting it. I heard it breathing. Man, I'm telling you, it was alive. 
scary blankety blank I heard it breathe the informant called to his girlfriend inside the car in what she later described as three octaves higher than his usual voice telling her to lay on the horn upon hearing the sound of the horn the Sasquatch sidestepped backing away from the car and stared at the kid well, I couldn't see his eyes or facial features but it was clear he was facing me and looking at me even as dark as it was he was only lit up by the car door light. The terrified kid said he got in the car, locked the doors, started the engine, and did a quick U-turn on Big Bar Dump Road. Amazingly, he said the Sasquatch followed them up the road where it turns onto Corral Bottom Road, keeping pace with the car for several hundred feet before trailing off where they could no longer see it. I spoke with the two informants at J.C. Cafe in Junction City for more than two hours. Their account never wavered, and they still showed great fear in recalling the event. The female witness never actually saw the creature, but said she heard its raspy breathing. It was evidently too dark to get much of a description other than what he could see of the creature, illuminated by the Camaro door's light. He knew right away what he was looking at, but in the shock of the moment he was able to distinguish little. Responding to my question, did you see a reflection from its eyes in the car light? He replied, there was no color or light emitted from its eyes. There was no smell from the creature, and he could not tell if it was male or female, only that it was this humongous, dark, towering image that he could hear breathing quite heavily and with angry intensity. He said it kept pace with his Camaro to about 20 miles an hour, then it trailed off, but he wasn't sure of his speed. His girlfriend, amazed by it all, only saw a blurred image through the foggy windows. A happy ending to this story, though. The Amherst couple are now married and expecting twins. This is the ending of story number three. Story number four. Late at night, Canada. In June 1996, chief editor of Animal Watch, Alex Michael, wrote of her encounter with Sasquatch in volume number one, issue number ten. I thought to copy the article here as I found it one of the more chilling accounts I have read, and educational as well. Late at Night by Alex Michael. A True Story. My family has always been notorious for doing things at odd hours, and as you may well know, the strangest things always happen late at night. It was an unusually warm autumn some years ago, and at 16 years of age I had just finished a summer job as an arts and crafts camp counselor. The only thing left to do was pick up a rather large trunk filled with my belongings. Unable to fit such a large trunk inside the VW Beetle I had purchased just a few weeks before, my mother was volunteered to transport it from the mountains back to the city in the larger of the family cars. Summer camp was a very wild place for me, with staff partying every night until the wee hours of the morning. My room was near the entrance of the staff residence where all these parties took place. By late July, sleep-deprived party wimps like myself were weeded out, so I built a single mattress-sized platform in the woods and then covered it with polyplastic. Bow Valley Provincial Park, an undisturbed protected forest, was only a stone's throw away. It is there that my mother, a small dog named Willow, and myself were going to retrieve my trunk at three o'clock on a Monday morning. Why three in the morning? Well, I could say it was the heat, but it was mostly because my father had not yet been told that the car would be leaving town. There was also my adolescent fear that knowledge of the platform construction would somehow reflect itself in a summer paycheck I had not yet received. My mother had to be at work by 6.30, so we had less than an hour to complete this covert action. As we approached the highway turnoff, a sliver of the moon cast a glowing border around southwestern Alberta's Mount Yamnuska. 
Driving several miles along the gravel road, the camp looked deserted. Summer staff had cleared out several weeks before, and a handful of permanent staff were either taking days off in the city or asleep in cabins several miles from the summer campsite. Angling off on the side of the road, my mother left the headlights on, pointing into the trees. There was some discussion about taking the twenty-pound dog named Willow for protection. However, Willow's track record for wandering off severely threatened a successful completion of the mission. Plus, very uncharacteristically, the dog named Willow now refused to get out of the car and was partially hidden under the driver's seat. Car headlights were of no value after the first few seconds of meandering through the forest. We had a flashlight, but I was having difficulty remembering the exact location. The fifteen-minute walk turned into a thirty-minute skin-scraping bushwhack, but finally we arrived at the isolated platform, even though the flashlight batteries were now dead. I assured my mother all that needed to be done was to take down the polyplastic rain cover and carry back a mattress and the trunk. It should only take two trips. She was noticeably silent. As we began working in the darkness, my mother began untying strings, securing the poly to the ground, and I was kneeling on top of the four-foot-high platform, stretching up to reach some tangled binder twine knots tied to a tree. A pungent smell suddenly flooded the air. My eyes moved from the knots to the tall length of plastic. There, distorted through the semi-transparent poly, was a huge shadow only about seven feet away. With the four-foot platform and me kneeling on top, the creature was easily at eye level. A split second later, there was an incredibly loud, screaming roar. Although I know of nothing to describe it, the sound was like a peacock scream, a bear growl, and a lion's roar, all somehow combined. I can't tell you if I screamed. I can't tell you much of anything other than my eyes continued to peer through the plastic at this massive shadow. My five-foot-three-inch tall mother had somehow leaped into the air and was now up on the platform beside me. Whatever it was finally turned and walked slowly away on its long behind feet. We continued watching as each heavy step could be heard contacting the ground. There were no visible ears, just a sparse mohawk-like fringe sprouting up from the tapering top of the creature's head. From behind, the upper body appeared massive. It continued to walk upright until disappearing into the trees. We stayed on top of the platform, motionless, for some time after. Then, finally, I started ripping down the plastic. I have no idea what my mother did during the next forty or fifty seconds, but my next memory was... Power walking through the forest, balancing a single mattress on top of my head with one hand and carrying the handle of the trunk in the other, I assumed my mother was holding up the other end of the trunk. With Willow still hidden under the driver's seat, it was a very quiet drive home. Late at night, they say that your mind can play tricks on you, but I am so certain. Brown bears had been in the area that summer. But I have never seen a bear walk upright that smoothly for that long a time. Or could it have been a very large, long-furred man standing over seven feet in height? I say man because intuition tells me that the creature was a male. Could it have been a Sasquatch that night? I will never really know for sure, but you can bet that I will keep telling the story, as if it were. This is the end of story number four. Story number five, Logan Lake, British Columbia, Canada. Nearest big city, Kamloop. The informants, a man and his wife, were not too far from me, camping in the summer of two thousand, and during their stay, they were experiencing some rather frightful events. The reason they contacted me was because they had come across my sighting. And because theirs happened so close, they wanted to talk to me. They were camping for two weeks, and during this time, their food was being taken, and even some clothes were missing. They thought maybe coyotes or even bears, but one morning, after hearing something in the campsite during the night, they woke up to find everything tossed around the campsite, 
Even the guy's boat on a trailer was moved a few feet. One night in particular, something hit the side window and broke it, and in the morning they found a large rock sitting there in the dirt. On another night, they said it sounded like a few people were outside their camper mumbling. Jill said it was like someone had their mouth full of food. I pictured the Sasquatches eating all their food and trying to talk to each other. After that morning incident, they cleaned up and had breakfast, when Jill had noticed bare footprints just off to the side of their camper, and they said it was obvious to them by the size of the prints that the visitor during the night had to be a Sasquatch, nothing else. They said the prints were around 18 inches long. The man put his size 12 foot inside the print, and there were still five or so inches more in length. They told me that a couple days later they were out in the boat fishing and actually saw this thing in their campsite while they were out in the boat. Apparently it was throwing their stuff around and making a mess of things. The couple described the Sasquatch as a reddish brown with long arms and a funny shaped head. They believed it to be a male because of its bulk, size, and height, which they say was about seven to eight feet tall. I asked if it could have been a bear, and they both replied, As God is our witness, what we saw was a Sasquatch. After describing the arms, legs, head, and all, there was nothing else it could have been. Personally, judging by their body language and the way they were trembling while talking to me, I believe them 100% no doubt whatsoever. The older couple said they waited in the boat for a while until they were certain it was gone, and as fast as they could they chucked everything in the camper and left the area, only packing up properly when they got to the town where they ended up staying that night. The couple were in their sixties, very clean and neat and polite. I can't see these two spinning a tail because it's been almost six years since that time, and they preferred not to be bothered by it. The sighting area is no more than a 40-minute car ride from me, and it's exciting because I've actually heard of another sighting in that area, but I didn't pay much attention to the person at the time, but now I'm going to try and track him down to hear what he has to say. I'm wondering if maybe there is a Sasquatch, and it could still be in that area. Tim Martindale, Merritt. British Columbia. This is the end of story number five. Story number six. Teapot Hill Hiking Trail in Cultus Lake Provincial Park. My name is Sunel Hodzik, and today, December 12, 2012, at approximately 3 p.m., I was hiking with my dog up Teapot Hill Hiking Trail near Cultus Lake Provincial Park in the Fraser River Valley. The nearest town would be toward Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. On my way down the trail, I was changing my music on my iPhone, not really paying attention to my surroundings, when I noticed that my dog, Lila, was barking like crazy. She was about five feet ahead of me and staring off into the distance, so I stopped and looked ahead when I noticed something in the bushes about fifty feet ahead of me. I was so scared that I froze, and just kept staring at it. After about a ten-second stare-down, I switched my camera on and quickly took a picture. Meanwhile, my dog is still barking like crazy. I then picked up a rock and threw it in the direction of the thing, and then I quickly turned around and ran back up the hill. I waited about until I saw someone else coming down the hill, and I followed him closely behind all the way down. So, uh, I do believe I saw the Sasquatch or Bigfoot that day. If I could describe it, I would say he was about eight to nine feet tall, very hairy and big. His skin color was brownish. His face was something like a monkey or ape. I took it with a full zoom on my iPhone 4. He was about 50 yards away from me. He's in the middle rightish of the picture. Only thing I noticed really was how he was standing, looking at me. It had a long face, but bigger forehead with long hair starting from about the top of its head. Sunel Hodzik, Chilliwack, British Columbia. That is the end of story number six.
Story number seven. Letter from El Paso County, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Summer, 1991. To whom it may concern. After reading some of your stories regarding Bigfoot, I thought I would add something I have kept rather a secret for quite some years. I was a cadet at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado, back in the summer of 1991. I had been at the academy for only a few weeks and was finishing up basic training when it happened. Now, the academy itself sits on the foothills of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Basically, I could step out of the cadet area and I would be standing in the mountains. There's plenty of brush, trees, and so on to conceal just about anyone of anything you want back there. Anyhow, one night, about 9 p.m., my roommate and I were laying in bed chatting about our upcoming camp out in Jack's Valley, an area just beside the academy where we did a lot of field training, when we heard what sounded like a woman screaming her head off. It was absolutely horrific to hear. What was most interesting was that prior to the blood-curdling noise, we could hear the other cadets in their rooms talking and joking. The campus was basically shut down for the night, and everyone was getting ready for the next day. I remember the ambient noise being rather loud. Then this scream came. All of a sudden you could have heard a pin drop, it was so quiet. I turned and asked my roommate if he heard what I and everyone else had just heard. I know, what a dumb question. He looks at me and says, Oh yeah, that's the local Bigfoot. I couldn't believe it, but of course, I heard it. He then proceeds to tell me about a buddy of his who saw a big hairy human drinking at a local lake. When it saw his friend watching it, it stood up, turned away, and walked into the forest. Of course, the next week in Jack's Valley, for me, was a very nervous affair. I was more worried about getting up at night and walking to the latrine by myself than I was running the assault course. Well, I just thought I'd add my two cents worth. Please withhold printing my name from this email if you decide to post it. Thank you. That's the end of story number seven. Story number eight. Lake Christie, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. My story. I don't even know where to begin. To this day, even the thought of what I am about to tell you makes every hair on my body stand up and brings tears to my eyes. Why the tears? I don't know. But they are genuine. I have never discussed this with anyone, and hadn't planned to, but... After stumbling across your site, I think I've had a change of heart. I live in Ontario, Canada. It is probably for this reason that I have never said anything until now. To my knowledge, almost all Sasquatch sightings are along the west coast on the continent and along the Rocky Mountains. I don't know how many sightings have been recorded this far east, but I know what I saw and heard on a few separate occasions. I used to work at a scout camp in northeastern Ontario. It is in a very remote location, nearly an hour's drive from any civilization, and one of the only true scout camps in all of Canada. It is surrounded by lakes and large hills of dense forests on all sides, and there are a few cottages scattered here and there around the main lake and camp that it's stationed on. Lake Christie, if I remember correctly. Although I live far away from this place, I worked there every summer from 1996 to 1999. My first experience happened in 1996. I was 16 years old. As a counselor, every two weeks we were moved around and put in charge of different scout and cub scout groups. I guess so everyone gets a chance to work with groups of all ages. On this particular rotation, I was working with one of the senior scout groups at the camp. As part of their last week there, they had to partake in what was called a solo night. 
This is where each camper is driven by one of the assistant camp directors to a remote location and left for the night with the bare necessities to survive, a sleeping bag, rations for one day, and two strike-anywhere matches. It was on this particular night that I will never forget the sounds that I heard. It was late at night in August, I am not exactly certain of the time, and I was sleeping in my tent in the upper field, which is not exactly on the upper campgrounds, but up the dirt road quite a ways and into the bush another five minutes walk. Altogether, probably a twenty-minute walk from the main campground. In the middle of my slumber I was suddenly awakened by a loud, deep shrieking, squealing sound that I had never heard before. I sat up in my tent, alarmed and uncertain of what I had heard. I thought maybe it was one of my colleagues playing a trick on me, and the other two counselors who were camped up there alone for the night, or one of the other two for that matter. This being a camp full of staff who are well known for their pranks, I wouldn't have put it past them. Then I heard the noise again. It was even louder. At first I thought it was a skunk being attacked by coyotes or something. I have heard that sound before, and witnessed it. For those who don't know, skunks actually make a sort of shrieking, squealing sound when being mauled to death. I saw it firsthand, but that is another story altogether. Editor's Note All Mustelidae, such as wolverines, weasels, badgers, civet cats, skunks, and otters, etc., emit a loud to groaning squeal or high rolling shriek often sounding like a woman in hopeless distress when caught by predators or in iron set traps. The sound can be very loud and unnerving, even from a wounded rabbit. However, the sound was much deeper. Then just as it had come, the sound stopped. I lay awake for the rest of the night, barely moving a muscle. When morning came, and the sun was bright enough, I slowly came out of my tent and walked to the main campground for breakfast. A few minutes later, the other two counselors came down to the main camp and gave me a mysterious glance. Then one of them approached and asked me, Was that you making all that racket last night? You scared poor Dave half to death. I just looked at him and said, What racket? With a stone-cold look. He gave me a knowing look and walked away. We never discussed it after that, and no one mentioned pulling a prank on me or the other two that night. Sooner or later, everyone owned up to their pranks, but no one even mentioned this one at all. It was not until months later that I realized what I may have heard. I was watching a documentary on TV about Bigfoot, and a crew hunting the evasive being had recorded what they thought were mating calls of the mysterious creature. When I heard the sounds of the recording come from the TV, the memories of that night came back to me. I quickly sat up, eyes glued to the screen, and the hairs on my neck stood up again. It sounded almost identical. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Again. My next encounter was two years later, 1998, in August again. It was late August, and there were no more cubs for the remainder of the summer, so the designated cub field and its cabins were vacant. So, not having much to do and no kids to watch, I decided to sleep in the cub field with the rest of the staff who had no children to take care of. The cub field is exactly that. It is a large clearing in the middle of a dense forest, up yet another hill. It is probably 150 yards wide and probably 200 to 250 yards long, with a row of small cabins on either side. While I laid in bed in one of the cabins, I woke a little after 12 o'clock a.m. I don't know why, but I was just suddenly awake. In the distance, I heard what I thought was howling, but I wasn't exactly sure. It sounded kind of muffled, but I was used to that sort of thing. I looked over at one of the other counselors staying in my cabin that night, and he was fast asleep. Then, out of nowhere, I heard what I thought was someone running right by my cabin. 
The steps were heavy and quick. I shot out of bed, grabbing my flashlight, wondering who was running around at this hour, since everyone was supposed to be in bed hours ago. I swung the door of the cabin open and shone my flashlight in the field. I couldn't believe what I saw next. About forty feet away, diagonally from me, I saw a large, hairy creature walking across the field very swiftly. I stood there in shock, wondering what my eyes were seeing. This thing was absolutely enormous. At first I thought it might be a bear, but then realized something. It was walking upright, on two legs. It was very tall, bulky, and had dark brown hair covering its entire body. Then, as if noticing my flashlight, it stopped, turned, and looked at me. I could see the yellow reflection of its eyes and its face. The face seemed to be almost half-human, half ape-like, having little hair on its face, but the skin was almost the same color as its hair, a sort of light brownish color. It stood there, looking at me, and I at it, for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably more like a few seconds. I wanted to scream. I wanted to wake up the others, but I was frozen. I was caught up in the phenomenon that I was seeing and couldn't move. That's when I noticed the smell. It was such a rancid odor, I had to plug my nose to save from puking. Then the creature turned and began to continue its swift movement across the field, and in a matter of seconds... It was across the field, walked between two cabins and into the dense forest. It was when it walked between the two cabins that I realized how tall this being was. I am six foot tall, without standing on my tiptoes. I can reach approximately to the seven foot four inch mark. This thing, as it walked between the two cabins, was taller than where the top one of the doors is. The cabins are elevated off the ground. From standing on the ground, I cannot touch the top of one of the doors. I am a couple of inches shy of it. I checked the next day. I would estimate that this thing was probably around eight feet tall, or close to it. Again, I lay awake for the remainder of the night, my hatchet by my side. This was the scenario for many of the remaining nights of that summer before I went home. There were even sleepless nights afterwards while at home. I didn't think I was afraid of anything until that night. I tried searching for tracks the next day, but to no avail. I couldn't find anything. The next day I asked one of the head counselors if there were any large animals in the general area, such as bears, and he said, No, apparently there were no bears for miles and miles. I never mentioned anything about what I saw that night. I didn't want anyone to think that I was crazy. I thought I would just wait and see if anyone else mentioned something before I said anything. No one did. My last encounter was the following and my final year, yet again in August. I don't know why I went back after all of the nightmares and sleepless nights from the previous summer, I guess I thought it was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. This time, I had taken a rowboat out onto the lake with a lady friend whom I had met that summer. Yes, there are female staff at scout camps. The main beach for the camp is in a small inlet of the lake, almost like a sort of small bay, before it opens up. As I was taking her on our romantic moonlight row, As I was taking her out on a romantic moonlight row, I heard what I thought was somebody whistling at me. I stopped rowing. She didn't hear it, but I know I did. I looked around at the surrounding shoreline and didn't see anything. Next, I heard a splash. A little one, as if someone had thrown a rock into the water. I thought maybe another couple was somewhere along that shore. I grabbed my flashlight. She grabbed hers. We scanned the shore from the safety of our boat to see if we could spot them. We were scanning in different sections. Then I saw them. Those eyes. 
the yellow reflection. I focused in on them, and they had an eerie resemblance to the ones I had seen the year before. Do you see them? I heard her ask. Without looking away, I said, No. You? No, she replied. What is that? Referring to the eyes caught in my light. A deer? she asked. Yeah, probably, I said. But I knew better. Then the eyes were gone. We then agreed that there was probably another couple out there, and we didn't want to get busy in front of other people. So I turned the boat around, and we went back to the camp. I have kept these secrets with me for five-plus years now. This is one thing I can honestly say I haven't told a single soul until now. I will never forget what I've seen and heard, although there was no physical contact. I have been extremely traumatized from what I've experienced. All this has been put in the back of my mind until now, probably because there was a show on this Discovery Channel about Sasquatch today. Like I said before, it still makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. This is the end of the eight stories. Thank you for listening. Welcome to another intriguing and true episode of Witness of the Unknown, documented stories of encounters with Bigfoot, as told to William Jevening, a Bigfoot researcher and author who has dedicated experience of more than 45 years with these flesh and blood creatures. And now, here is your host, William Jevening. Welcome to another intriguing and true episode of Witness of the Unknown, documented stories of encounters with Bigfoot, as told to William Jevening, a Bigfoot researcher and author who has dedicated experience of more than 45 years with these flesh and blood creatures. And now, here is your host, William Jevening. This story comes to us through the courtesy of Bigfoot researcher and author William Jevning, narrated by Jim Sower. This story is from Rich Grumley, who is the director of the California Bigfoot Organization. In 1980 through 1981, I was working as a security guard on a high-tension tower project here in California. I met a man who was a cat skinner operating a bulldozer leveling off the pads where each of these high-tension towers was to be placed. I noted he had on his pickup truck 25 to 30 decals from places he had been hunting and introduced myself. During the conversation, I mentioned Bigfoot, and he told me that in the mid to late 1970s, he was doing a little poaching, with forestry officials' permission, in a locked and gated area near Bishop, California. They had given him a key so he could go in any time he wanted. This particular time, the gate was still locked, as it always was. He let himself in with his four-wheel drive pickup to the area known as Four Points. He drove over a hill, and there, to his surprise, were Department of the Interior Vehicles and Bureau of Land Management men, all in their Smokey the Bear outfits with guns, 
searching a campground. The hills, mountains, roads, etc. They grabbed this hunter, took his deer rifle away from him, and questioned him for seven to eight hours as to what he was doing there. The local forestry officials identified him as a trusted friend, and he was let go, but told to never come back. He had determined during his interrogation that the reason the BLM and Department of Interior were there, in force, was that a Bigfoot creature had gone through there the day before and had turned over a large trash container of the type you find behind large department stores, dumpsters, that no man can even begin to move and had killed several people. Over the years, the story was passed through several people, in fact, quite a few Bigfoot researchers, but no one was able to come up with one single clue. Then, in early to middle 1991, a young student also interested in investigating the Bigfoot mystery called the CFBO's hotline to tell me that he had heard that story several years ago and it had always stuck with him. He went on to relate that when he was doing some Bigfoot research in the town of Bishop, California, Inyo County, 1989 through 90, he met a former policeman who said he was on the Bishop Police Force in the mid to late 1970s. The student related the foregoing story of Bigfoot to the ex-police officer from Bishop, and he confirmed it. The officer said the story was the talk of the law enforcement agencies in that area at the time, but they were under very tight orders not to say anything about the incident and the related deaths. Richard Grumley lived from 1935 to 2000. Thanks everyone for joining me this week. Be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevening and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. The name of this story, Two Tales of the Yeho. Curious Legend of the Kentucky Mountains, four or five versions of this curious and strange legend, come into my collection over a period of about six years, 1948 to 1954, from an isolated region of the Kentucky Mountains. At first I did not know what to make of it, but having also collected a few versions of The Bear's Son, story minus the half-bear, half-man introduction, I guessed that this was the introduction now broken away and told separately. It now appears to be a distinct legend, since Dr. Archer Taylor refers me to the long search for American versions by Mr. Rudolph Atrochi. And now that I reflect on this item, I realize that and now that I reflect on this item, I realize that it is not unique to Kentucky Mountain folklore. During my youth in these mountains, it was not unusual to hear a rumor of some half-wild man, naked and hairy, being found in the woods, living close to animal state. This kind of Romulus Remus legend seems to stick in the minds of the folk, but how this particular legend made its way into eastern Kentucky is a mystery to me, the following version was taken down in pencil in 1950 from the lips of Lee Maggard, who lived in a small cabin on the south slope of the Pine Mountain Range near the small lumber town of Putney, Harlan County, Kentucky. He had heard it on Maggard's branch, Leslie County, Kentucky. The Yeho Once there was man out hunting, he got lost, and after a while, he began to get hungry. 
He came to a big hole in the ground, and he thought he would venture down into it. He went down in there, and he found that the old Yeho lived in there. There was deer meat hanging up, and other food piled around the walls. The man was afraid at first, but Yeho didn't bother him, and he went toward that meat to get him some. The Yeho walked over and looked at the knife and said, Yeho, Yeho, a time or two. He cut it off a piece of the meat, and he started eating it. Well, the man stepped over to the middle of the pit and took out his flint and built him up a fire. And the Yeho watched him and looked at the fire and at the flint and said, Yeho, Yeho, again. The man put his meat on a stick and browled him a nice piece and started eating it. The Yeho watched him and acted like he wanted a piece. The man cut it off a piece of the briled meat and reached it over. And the Yeho commenced to eating it up and smacking its lips and saying, mm, Yeho, Yeho. Well, the man lived there with it a long time, and they got along all right. After so long, there was a young'un born to him, and it was half man and half Yeho. And the Yeho took such a liking to the man, it wouldn't let him leave. He got to wanting to get away and go back home. One day, he slipped off, and the Yeho followed him and made him go back. Went on that way for a good while, but he picked him a good time and slipped away. This time he got to the shore where there was a ship ready to sail. He got on the ship, and he looked, and he saw the Yeho coming with a young'un. It screamed and hollered for him to come back, and when it saw he wasn't going to come, why, it just tore the baby in two and held it out one half to him and said, Yeho, Yeho! He sailed on off and left it standing there. The version that Dr. Taylor refers to in my book, South from Hell for Sartan, is called The Origin of Man. Another version was given to me by this teller's grandson. It has the same title and contents, except that the Yeho has six children and tears them all in two and throws them after the embarked man. Another text, similar to the one given above, was accidentally erased from my tapes. The following text was recorded from Joe Couch, Appalachia, Virginia, in 1954. He had heard it from his people while he lived in Perry County, Kentucky. The Hairy Woman One time, I was prowling in the wilderness, wandering about, kindly got lost, and so weak and hungry I couldn't go. When it began to get cool, I found a big cave and crawled back in there to get warm. Crawled back in and come upon a leaf bed, and I dozed off to sleep. I heard an awful racket coming into that cave, and something come in and crawled right over me and laid down like a big old bear. It was a hairy thing, and when it laid down, it went chomp, chomp, a chawing on something. I thought to myself, well, I'll see what it is and find out what it's eating. I reached over, and a hairy-like woman was there eating chestnuts. Had about a half a bushel there. I got me a big handful of them and went to chewing on them, too. Well, in a few minutes, she handed me over another big handful, and I eat chestnuts until I was kindly full and wasn't hungry any more. Directly, she got up and took off and out of sight. Well, I stayed on there till next morning, and she'd come in with a young deer. Brought it in, and with her big long fingernails, she ripped its hide and skinned it. And then she sliced the good lean meat and handed me a bite to eat. I kindly slipped it behind me, afraid to eat it raw and afraid not to eat it, being she give it to me. She'd cut off big pieces of deer meat and eat it raw. Well, I laid back on the other pieces she give me over as she eaten hers. She was going to see that I didn't starve. When she got gone again, I built up a little fire and briled my meat. 
After being hungry for two or three days, it was good cooked. Yes, buddy. She come in while I had a fire. She come in while I had my fire built, brailing my meat, and she run right into that fire. She couldn't understand because it kindly burned her a little. She jumped back and looked at me like she was going to run through me. <laughs> I said, uh oh, I'm going to get in trouble now. Well, it was cold and bad out, so I just stayed another night with her. She was a woman, but was right hairy all over. After several days, I learned her how to brile meat and that fire would burn her. She got shy at the fire and got so she liked briled meat and wouldn't eat it raw anymore. We went on through the winter that way. She would go out carrying deer and bear. So I lived there about two years, and when we had a little kid, one side of it was hairy and the other side was slick. I took a notion I'd leave there and go back home. I began to build me a boat to go away across the lake in. One time after I had left, I took a notion I'd slip back and see what she was doing. I went out to the edge of the cliff and looked down into the mountain, and it looked like two or three dozen of hairy people coming up the hill. They were all pressing her, and she would push them back. They wanted to come on up and come in. I was scared to death, afraid they's going to kill me. She made them go back and wouldn't let them come up and interfere. Well, I took a notion to leave one day when my boat was ready. I told her one day I was going to leave. She followed me down to my boat and watched me get ready to go away. She was crying, wanting me to stay. I said, no, I'm tired of the jungles. I'm going back to civilization again, going back. When she knowed she wasn't going to keep me there, she just grabbed the little one and tore it right open with her nails, throwed me the hairy part, and she kept the slick side. That's the end of that story. This is the end of the story. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com.